I think I've got it. I think that was the thing. And then I've got this button over here, right? And that does with the thing. Hey there, friends. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time it might be in your part of the world. Greetings, my excellent friend. It is so good to see you. My name is Jeff Fritz. And today, what day is today? Today is January 3rd, 2024. And we're going to write a little bit of code today. How you doing there, chat room? I've got broadcasts going out live to YouTube and to Twitch. Taking a look here, we've got a couple things going on that we're going to dive into as Jarmuary continues. This is a theme month. I do tech theme months every now and again. We're doing a tech theme month here all about building with ARM-based devices, it, having some fun, learning about ARM processor, building and working on um, yeah, what it's like to, to have some tech working over there. Uh, Simac. Simac just resubscribed for 21 months. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll make another donation. I didn't have a chance yesterday to take a look at the various charities that we were going to consider. But we'll make another donation to a, to a charity. Thank you so much for that support. Um, all right. I, um, I've got a new hat on today. I was at the College Football Hall of Fame in Atlanta. And uh, just getting this set up so that it can be detected. Um, so let's call this College Football HOF. It's a longer tag name, but hey, it's my tag. I can give it whatever I want. Um, so how are you, chat room? There's a bunch that we're going to get into today. I, I still am having problems with um, with my Windows on ARM device picking up and installing the latest updates. Um, it looks like this is an older machine that I was that I was given. Um, and uh, it, it, it might just not pick up the, the latest stuff. I don't know. Um, but all I what I can say is it didn't. <laughs> so it is it is only running the 2021 version of Windows. So we're not gonna, we're actually not going to get any of the Windows developer tools installed for us or be able to install or work with it at all on this machine, which kind of makes it counter to the whole idea of it's a developer device and it, it doesn't support the developer tools that Windows is now coming with out of the box. So um, I've installed most of them by hand. So I don't get to use uh, DevDrive. Uh, okay, fine. Um, everything else just works. It took me 
two, three hours yesterday to get everything set up. Uh, I'm still okay with that because e even though it took me that long, I it was still a little bit faster than how long it would take me to get other things set up and running on a uh, similar machine. So I, I, I'm still going to go back and point to getting things configured for um, my Linux laptop is easily the fastest uh, machine that I've had to set up because I can just pull those settings down from GitHub and it just it just ramps up and, and runs very, very quickly, very, very nicely. Um, I left my Gunner glasses in the other room that I wanted to wear today. Uh, which ones are these? Um, you know what? No, we're going to go with the Warcraft ones today. So, um, let me see here. So, let me catch up on, on chat over here. There's the chat room right over there. We're broadcasting. We're going to have some folks on YouTube and Twitch coming through over there. Let me... Uh, come on now. The, the chat on YouTube is always finicky. Their screens and things are just... Mm. Um, how you doing there, Neat Palm? Rest, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Zolt. How you doing on YouTube? Mix Max, hello, hello. Um, McNets, how's it going there? Nitro Evil, good day to you. We had Cymac with the resub. Um, I love Strux, good morning to you. Joystick Nick, hello, great to see you, friend. How's things? I'm going to get some uh, music going here. And uh, this is Stream Beats by Harris Heller. Music that's... Let me just double check the level. Yeah. Music that's DMCA free, royalty free. Listen to it wherever you want. There's all kinds of genres available out there. Check it out at streambeats.com. I like the synth wave and, and instrumental playlists here. I think they're a lot of fun. Um, and, and they're just kind of groovy to have in the background, background while we're writing code together. You really think I need to make some custom pajamas? <laughs> I... Hmm. Well, you, you only see me from the shirt down, shirt up. So, I don't know. I don't think we need to go that far. Um, great to see you, my friend. Cymax says, Happy New Year. You say it every year, but this year is going to be the one where you finally make the jump to a developer role. Hey, hey you know what? If if that's something that you're you're struggling with, you want help with, there's lots of folks that, that have made career changes, career jumps, that hang out in chat here, hang out in, in the Discord. You want some advice, you want to talk to some folks, uh, happy to to bounce some of those ideas uh, off of you and around. There we go. I got the World of Warcraft. These are the Horde glasses. You can see right there on the bottom. Let me put it over the black background. You see the Horde logo embedded in the background there and also on the arm. There we go. On the arm of the glasses, there's a Horde logo and, of course, red trim so these are the World of Warcraft Horde glasses. They, of course, come with an appropriate Gunner World of Warcraft uh, bag. Nice, soft silk bag. Uh, right? They've got the... Uh, there it is. The Horde logo on that and a World of Warcraft case with the Horde logo on the front. There it is. Really like this pair. They're a lot of fun. And, of course, there's a white cloth here that is... Gunner and World of Warcraft themed. Look at that on the front and on the back. Look at that. That's mighty fine um, Torin logo on the back. Oh, and it says, of course, on the inside of the box, for the Horde. So our friend Fierce Kittens has the Alliance ones. You probably saw my picture with her on Instagram last month. So we got the World of Warcraft glasses going here today. So you think pajamas would would help me code in comfort in style? Um, not gonna lie, um, you can't see what I'm wearing below the shirt. Maybe I am. <laughs> Got to do a lazy coding stream where I just copy pasta old code and wear pajamas on the couch. Um, I'm not at a point with some of the code that we're writing where uh, I would say I would consider anything lazy. We're, we're trying to race and, and get a handful of things done um, because it, conversions, upgrades, these types of things that are going to set us up 
for being able to do a lot more. And I think Tag Zap, as, as it grows, as we push it, is going to get to a point where there's going to be some fun happening there. Uh, only thing really holding back Simac is, is between keyboard and chair. You need a little bit of encouragement. You need some some push. Let me know. Happy to 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 offer a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of coaching, and and help you get there. Not calling me. No, no, not the type of project that we're working on. I need to I need to be a little bit more on a, of a push right now, um, so we can be ready for events in February, March, April. So, oh, I am always working. It's kind of crazy. I'm off this week, and I'm streaming every day. Like, that's a thing. Let's, uh, I'm going to publish this, and over here we'll do a hat command. Taking the picture, sending it over, and... Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. Only 43% certainty. That is awful. Um, yeah, it's got 100% on it. Um, so try that one more time. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. 88%. That's better. That's better. So this is from the College Football Hall of Fame, um, which is right outside the Georgia World Congress in Atlanta. So Georgia World Congress is right across... It, right across the street from Mercedes-Benz Stadium, where the Atlanta Falcons play, where the Peach Bowl was held this past weekend, that Penn State played in. Um, didn't get a chance to go in the Hall of Fame, but walked around the, the shop there, killing some time. Saw the College Football Hall of Fame hat. I had to pick one up. Come on. I had to pick one up. So, um, totally did that. Um, I have... The, the, so those are the two hats that I got while I was in Atlanta. I got a Peach Bowl hat. I got the College Football Hall of Fame hat. I'm not picking up an, an Atlanta sports hat. Um, and and I also have the, the hat I got for Christmas. We're going to wear that tomorrow. The Voodoo Donuts hat. We'll have that one tomorrow. So the collection is growing. I started doing some some cleanup, some work here. I, I have a lot more to do. Um, where I'm, I'm turning my home studio here. Typically, you see me, this is a straight-ahead shot. And right now, I have a, a green screen, a, the green screen I used way back when I started streaming, right behind me, and I've got it dropped out for this background. For a long time, I was doing stand-up uh, scenes at a table right behind me. And, and I did that with the workshop, and it was really, really great because I have a green curtain hanging on the wall behind there. So I'm redecorating a bit. The idea is I want to get clips and 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 I have I have some hat rack uh, stuff and I'm gonna cover the wall behind me with my hats. And I'm gonna move the table and the green the green curtain over here in front of the closets in in this room. And I'm gonna put the table in front of that on this side. That'll allow me to have the camera over here pointing across, for which is already kind of at an angle, but it's at a weird angle because, right, I can't put the camera directly behind me for a straight ahead shot. So if I put it going across like that, I can have it over here and I can be watching. The problem is my cheat screen is above me, my confidence monitor. So either I need to move the confidence monitor over to this wall, not impossible. Or I need to stand up another monitor over there. Probably a heck of a lot easier to do. So lots to figure out, lots to consider. Um, let me catch up on chat here. Um, always great to talk to you, Joystick Nick. It, hey, make sure you check out Joystick Nick, um, who's doing... So Nick is extremely creative when it comes to video special effects and production. Make sure you, you check out what he's doing over there. Um, some He's doing some mind-bending stuff with just what's on OBS and in the box that a lot of folks do. 
Um, so I, he's been helping out folks with video productions for virtual events, webinars, these types of things. If you want some special effects it, it, that, that can be done, quite frankly, it, done well and, and looks professional, make sure you check out Joystick Nick. Make sure you check him out. Um, clip that, create an advertisement, make it happen. There you go. Um, let me see here. I'm going to, so I love Strux here says, um, off topic, but do I know if there will be more language support for polyglot notebooks, the .NET interactive notebooks? Um, you want to use systems languages. T tell me more there. I love Strux. What do you mean by systems languages? It already, you can already use, I thought you could use PowerShell in there. Let me know. What are you, what are you looking for in there? Um, your family just went to Georgia, saw the Georgia Aquarium. It's like the second largest. It is there were so many people there when we were there that i um it, I, I we couldn't stick around long we went in for for an hour hour and a half and and toured and saw the sharks saw the the river exhibit it, it started looking at the next exhibit with the dolphins and we we're like th there are way too many people here so, i mean kids literally kids running around carrying on i'm like i am overstimulated goodbye like I had to bail, I had to bail. So, uh, how many hats do I own? Asks Minoj. Um, we're closing in on two hundred. We are closing in on two hundred. Looking at the Custom Vision website, um, Custom Vision knows about. Um, come on now. Custom Vision knows about one hundred and forty-three hats. There's a handful of hats that I purposely do not wear on stream. Um, they would dox me a little bit. Hats that have like the kids, um, the, the kids school on it. Um, the, things like that, that I, I purposely don't wear. My, my former high school uh, hats. Um, there's, there's also a number of hats that I don't wear on stream and that I don't have loaded into custom vision that are green. That's another thing. If I, if I drop, if I finish this remodeling that I want to do, I won't be on the green screen all the time. You'll be able to see things behind me and I'll be able to wear green. So that's another bit there to consider, but we're, we're closing in on 200 right now. They're, they're in a box. I moved the box actually behind me here. Cause I was looking for and getting stuff set up over here for, running the uh the win sdk the windows developer kit box i keep wanting to call it win sdk but that's me as a software guy um so long a collection doesn't get to be a problem that's right the collection is not a problem so uh how you doing there dr cox good to see you yes it is a wednesday stream we're gonna do a thursday stream and a friday stream what's up chaotic monkey good morning to you um the new noise filter by Finite Singularity is incredible. Um, I'm not quite sure how I would use that on a stream. I've got some stuff that that I'm I'm and I've talked to Nick about that we're going to do on stream here that I think are going to be fun. I certainly have the video card horsepower. I have an Nvidia 3700 here that can do some of the green screen effects without green screen. So. There's, there's things that we can do there. I don't know. Um, more than you can hold. Thanks, Jeff's hat stand. Virtual interactive hat museum is needed. Sinclairinator. Go to hats.csharpfritz.com. Head over there. Actually, do I have... Uh, do I have the full screen? Um, ba -ba -ba. Let me turn off the... There we go. Right, so it's the wrong stinger, but hey, whatever. That's fine. There you go. So, um, hat csharpfritz.com. This is a blazer with .NET 7. So you can even say built with .NET 7 and blazer. Um, it doesn't have all the hats on it, but it's got a lot of them. It's got a lot. With a cool little CSS flip effect here. So plenty more to load and honestly I should set this up as like an automated thing here to get stuff 
flipping. Um, you can do things like search for Marvel hats, and it'll show you here's the Marvel hats, including Loki for president. So, um, but I, I definitely need to get more of them loaded in here. So, like, the Peach Bowl hat, the College Football Hall of Fame hat that I got here, uh, need to get them loaded, and I even added a little, right, I've got a little blurb that this is what should be appearing when the chatbot pops in. So, hey, Finite Singularity, hello, hello. Um, did I visit the first Chick-fil-A? Asks I Love Strux. I did not. No. Custom throwback menu, oh, cool. You want to be able to run C++ or Rust in the code blocks? Ah, no. Um, th those have not been built. Um, but they're, they're things that can be extended and, and added as kernels. The team hasn't built that because they see polyglot notebooks as something that's used for either higher level languages and folks to be able to manipulate and work with data quickly and easily. Um, so C++, Rust, Go... They're, they're too low level for the audience that that team is trying to reach, right? Python, JavaScript, uh, C Sharp, F Sharp makes sense for their goals with Polyglot Notebooks. So, Chris Jones, hello. Chris Jones just resubscribed for 59 months. Happy New Year, Fritz and Chat C Sharp Wave. Happy New Year to you. Thank you so much, and I'll make another donation. Very much appreciate that. Um, so, Robert Tables is here. Hello, hello. Um, Mom, look at that. Mom is here. Yeah, Mom. Um, we, there's, there's over 150 in the AI. Right, 143 in the AI. We just got this one, the the College Football Hall of Fame hat. Um, there you go, look at that. With the college Chick-fil-A College Football Hall of Fame logo on it. That resolution is awful. But what can I tell you? That's and then I've got the Peach Bowl hat that we picked up. You can see it's got a Penn State logo on the one side. The other side has an old miss logo. You can't see it because I'm there you go. So that I think that's kind of a cool, a, a cool hat to commemorate my visit to to my first bowl game this past weekend. So I've got a handful of Gunner hats, um, no, actually two, Penn State blue band hat, so on and so forth. But I need to get more of them loaded onto the hats collection website here. So that's right, Mom's here. Hey, look at that; she's got the dancing bot emotes. Right, something something to be said when Mom's visited here. You should have known it already existed. It's just a matter of, of adding new ones there. I feel like there's a, a process to this that I could kind of kind of flesh out and make it real easy to just add a new hat and to to the AI and get this updated. And even then, I want to get the, the hat AI over here. I want to get it into Semantic Kernel. So it's using the image detection libraries over there. I had a conversation... And I swapped emails. Don't say conversation. I swapped emails with Stephen Taub. You know Stephen Taub of the, the, the tome of performance updates for .NET blog post. Um, so Stephen knows performance inside and out. He's working with the Semantic Kernel folks. And um, we're, we're going to meet up and talk more about things that we can do with Semantic Kernel um, Yeah, in the next few weeks. So ahead. So... We'll be doing some semantic kernel coming up because I want to move the Q&A bot off and into there. And I want to have semantic kernel be able to answer and, and launch into responding with some of these, these blocks of information about the hats. A Lou the Crow. Hello, hello. Um, so, yeah, the kernels, Sinclair Nate is right. The kernels for the polyglot notebooks, they're all open source. Folks can extend it. It's just a question of the audience. Is it the audience that folks want for those types of languages? Let me come back over here. We can talk about that. That's the wrong. That's the wrong wipe. It's the wrong wipe. Like, who's doing this? Uh, no, not the, not that button. Where is it? Uh, scene control. Yeah, it should have used that one. Whatever. Um, <laughs> you use a custom shader. Okay. Um, let me see here. Catching up here. 
Um, Happy New Year's, it says Napalm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> stream effects I've been struggling with. I'm trying to get the right. Is, is it the tilt to work properly in there? Uh, Yitzhak uh, asks, uh, let me put that question up here. Um, <laughs> right there. Uh, how do I feel about free code camp? You saw that they're offering C-Sharp in their curriculum. The folks at Free Code Camp, great people. They're really trying to make um, education free for anybody that wants to get involved with tech. Um, we've collaborated. We, the .NET team, uh, my team, have collaborated with them to help build that C-Sharp curriculum and, and to effectively give you a path to a C-Sharp certification with the community, with Free Code Camp, um, that Microsoft endorses. So, best of both worlds. Here's a community organization building and delivering content, and Microsoft is going to support and endorse what they're delivering. I think that makes everybody happy. Um, how you doing there, Apricot? Oh, yeah, we're doing good. We're doing good. Um, old school coder, hello, hello. Um, why is Twitch buffering and stuttering? I'm clear on my 60 frames a second here. I haven't dropped a frame. Restream looks good over here. So we are broadcasting to YouTube and Twitch. If you want to jump over to YouTube, there's only a few folks over there, but Restream bot is sending messages back and forth. Um, how you doing there? AO War Aries. Got your first book of the year called Think Like a Billionaire, Become Like a Billionaire. As a man thinks, so is he. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Good luck to you. Let, let us know what how the book goes and what you think of it. Um, boom, boom. Doesn't see any buffering or stuttering in Toronto. Uh, yeah, it sounds like from a couple folks here, things look good. Cymac, yes, there is a Cloud Skills Challenge running to the end of the month that goes through the C-Sharp certification material. Yes, yes, yes. So. Um, thank you, Sinclairinator. Yeah. Even for someone who's been in the .NET game for a decade, love all the learning and interaction. Thank you. So I'm, I'm stopping at noon today. I have a podcast, the Blazer Puzzle podcast. I'm recording with our friend Carl Franklin. Of course, you can find the Blazer Puzzle podcast featuring Carl and I, blazerpuzzle.com. I'm also going to start recording today my re-recording. Re and I, there was even a question about this on yesterday's YouTube video. It was posted in the comments about uh, rerunning my C Sharp for Beginners series. And we are doing that. And mom, mom, are you still there? Mom, paging, paging mom. Mom, are you there in the chat room? Mom was a longtime teacher. And we're, we're rebuilding, rerunning the series. But instead of doing hour, two hour lessons. And I think even, even joystick, it, it, yeah, right. Where's mom's, uh, I have a button for mom, right? Where, where to go? Uh. There it is, right? Hey, Ma, we get some meatloaf. We want it now. The meatloaf. I think Mom left. What's she doing? I never know what she's doing. I know what she's doing. She she took off, even though she might have the the video on the big screen TV there in the family room, and and she's chatting on her phone or whatever. That's cool. But we are. I am going to re start recording the first in the series. Um, these are going to be three to five minute videos. I've got more than fifty episodes planned in this getting started with C Sharp series, and it's going to be called C Sharp in the Cards. And I'm gonna teach you C Sharp from the beginning, not most of you know C Sharp, but I'm gonna teach, teach C Sharp from the beginning and all the examples run through a deck of cards. Grab your favorite deck of cards, poker cards, um, and we're gonna walk through and we're gonna learn about we're going to learn about objects. We're going to learn about values. We're going to learn about strings and numbers and sorting and arrays and collections. And we're going to do it with a deck of cards. Now, got a little bit more feedback yesterday. This is a deck of cards from the Windows 7 launch that 
I keep on my desk. Um, so they're old and beat up and 20 years old. Um, the idea is, do we make a C-sharp tips and tricks deck of cards with the Super C-sharp logo on the back and on the face, not just... Right, and... and Right, I'm I'm kind of disappointed in this deck of cards, right? Because right, there's the four of diamonds, and it's a four of diamonds. So what? It's a four of diamonds. Let's put a tip in the middle of the face of the deck of cards, so that while you're playing cards, while you, right as you're going through some of the lessons, there's a C sharp tip or trick or fact on the cards to learn from. We can get those made for a couple bucks, and um, at the of course at the end of the series, we're going to publish the the self publish as a book. Folks can can pick up for three four bucks, whatever it is, five bucks on Amazon. Have it on your Kindle and go through the series. Old school coder managed to go through yesterday's stream. I got a long way, right? After the mishap of the system upgrade, yes. Dr. Cox is getting some buffering. Try flipping over to YouTube. If Twitch is giving you issues, flip over to YouTube. Um, you like learning about money? Oh, very cool. So, yeah, we got the meatloaf there. She's getting the meatloaf. Thank yeah, Robert Tables has it right. Um, I know I've got to re I've got to redo the uh, the donation messages and whatnot. So, too many people jump past the underlying understanding of just want to code, right? There's and, and folks don't understand that learning C sharp is just the first step in learning to be a software developer. So, yeah, Windows Seven was twenty years ago. Can you believe it? So, king queen e king minus queen equals check. <laughs> um, C sharp recipes book as cards. Kind of, Eric. Kind of. Yeah. Right. Um, King minus queen probably should be one. So. Um, yep. You can flip over to the YouTube stream. We are live over there. There's, it, it looks like it's just me on the YouTube, but, um, youtube.com C sharp Fritz is where that is. All right. Um, we are diving in. We are using the windows dev kit and uh, building, working on ARM, and we're gonna continue working with Blazor. Building a Blazor web application, we're actually migrating from Razor Pages, using full Visual Studio, full .NET, but it's on ARM. So it, this is a great experience because .NET is a, is a just-in-time compiled series of programming languages and tools. Unlike C++, Go, Rust, where you build and target a runtime, an operating system that you want things to run on, processor set, you, you don't target any of those. You can target just generically run on the runtime. And as long as you're running managed code, it will just work on other operating systems, processors, and so forth. This is very cool for and folks in the Java ecosystem have this also because we've got a compiled strongly typed language that builds and runs on a native runtime. Folks that work in JavaScript, TypeScript, Python, these higher level languages, there's an interpreter and things there. And, and you can really, it's really hard to directly interact with the processor or memory. We can do that with unmanaged code in .NET. So we get the best of both worlds interacting with with our machines or hardware so um we like that we like that a lot avari with a question here is will the cards be c-sharp only or also .NET framework tips um framework in that we'll probably touch on right i'll probably design the cards live on stream but probably not just c-sharp language features but yeah maybe some framework things like how to use, how to work with JSON, how to work with files, how to work with uh, entity framework. Maybe those are three of the suits. I don't know. We'll see. Flashcards a bit, yeah. Yeah, Manoj, yeah. Um, you remember getting Windows 7 on OEM disks, right? Same. I'm not pulling your arm stacking. 
<laughs> wish you, you wish you could get the C Sharp Dev Kit in Neo Vim. Why can't you? Oh, Dev Kit. No, you can't. Um, right? It's the the debugger and tools are are built and integrated with Visual Studio Code, but you can get OmniSharp syntax highlighting IntelliSense completion in NeoVim. Yes. With a C-sharp deck, you could do some magic trick. Uh, see the away to sync card. <laughs> a little bit. Native cards since their W set. I see what you did there bitwise. Um, yeah, the best you get now is OmniSharp. Yeah. Yep, XAML, CS, HTML. No, not supported. You're right. You're right. Which... It's, it, that's right, it just isn't as good. Here's the, here's the thing. Here's, let, here, I'll tell you a secret. And it's not really a secret because it's publicly available, just nobody's acknowledged it. The primary authors of OmniSharp were Microsoft employees. So when they got full corporate support to build and bring over the entire stack to run in Visual Studio Code and call it DevKit. They didn't want to abandon OmniSharp, so they built the pieces so that OmniSharp could continue living and they could build and deliver a complete experience based on the other things that they've built that run in Visual Studio 2022, 2019, 2017, 2015, so on and so forth. So, it's, it's the same, it's a lot of the same, it's not all the same. It's a lot of the same folks that work on both products. It's, there are some features that because of the way they've been built and interact with the operating system and whatnot, the corporate decision was to keep those closed source and to keep those as paid features. That's Microsoft's decision they can make. But they also made a ton of features completely free and easy to use that because they further supported and invested in OmniSharp. I don't think you can get ReSharper in NeoVim. No, 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 no. Um, you start at one point, you end up going into other areas to expand your knowledge base. Yes, yeah. You'd be fine with a paid plugin to get into NeoVim. Now that's, now that is interesting feedback that is that would be very interesting for the c-sharp dev kit team to hear um right there's uh where is it tech community um so there i mean c-sharp dev kit is very early in um in its life um, uh, ask questions and it pushed over now to VS code on stack overflow. Let me look here. See if, uh, request features. Nope. Not going to let me do it. All right. We can't talk about that and interact with it because Microsoft security won't let me. Oh, well, um, you want to continue using Vim? That's cool. Hey, um, NeoVim is is in a version of the VI Classic Editor that's been updated. That has a a very rich plugin system, um, and is is enhanced to to al allow a much more modern editor experience. All the things that you can do in VI and Vim just updated and behaves a little bit differently with that plug-in system in NeoVim. So a lot of folks really like it. I look at it and think um, the customizations and plug-in model that, that folks that are, are, are diehard VI Vim NeoVim users, what they're building and interacting and trying to put into their editors it's already available for you in Visual Studio Code. It's already built. It's already available for you. It's free to download and use. It's all open source. So, and look, I know how to use VI. I know how to use Vim. It's, I prefer to use Visual Studio. 
So the Vim plugin is, uh, is not the same. It just helps you with navigation. Like, so a lot of folks that are, that, that prefer VI, prefer Vim, um, they, they aren't terribly fond of the, the Vim plugin for Visual Studio Code. You love Vio Neo Vim? Cool. And it VS Vim gets you close enough. I, how you doing there, Fish Belly on Twitch? Um, and hey, look, if if that's what makes you happy, go for it. That's why I do minimal March. The whole month of March, we'll be coding at the command line using Vim on various devices. We'll be on Linux. We'll be on Mac. We'll be on a Raspberry Pi. We'll be on a whole bunch of different devices, but we're going to be coding completely at the command line because you can. And it's important to me that we show this experience. Uh, it's a good start. Gets you the motions. File navigation splits. Yeah, they are. They are. Um, Loco, how you doing there? Happy New Year to you. Uh, that's very kind. Send a hug. You don't get the Jarmuary thing out of context. Um, how's this? There you go. Um, Minoj does not prefer NeoVim. Takes a lot of time to set up, but it works for many. Right. In 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 getting more speed in your editor, you have to identify, load, and customize many many plugins to get to the same to get to a, a similar feature set as a more full featured editor like Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio, Rider, and some of the other editors that are out there. So, look, if, if I'm, I'm happy that folks with every editor can build and work with .NET at the command line. Like, that's a cool thing. That's a very cool thing. And I'm happy to, to support, endorse, and show that coming up in March. But this month, this month we're we're working on ARM-based devices. We're learning all about ARM processors and building with .NET. We're gonna have a lot of fun here. Um, DGen one with a <laughs> trying to trying to win at at the C sharp playing cards here. Card tip: that var this card equals cards dot first card card dot suit equals spades and card dot rank equals ace. Okay. See what you've done there. I like to make suits and ranks enumerations. Make them, right, make them enum and with them as enums, I can come through and, and it becomes very clear whether it's a spade and it's not a magic string there in my code. So let me head over to the ARM device here and let's make sure I have that configured. Da, 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 da. Studio mode, and here we go. Yeah, we're all set to go. Right? No, uh, I don't think. No, I don't think I had that right. Here we go. Yeah, that's not that. That's not that's not right. I didn't do that right. It should be this one. And there we go. That's the way we want it. All right. I've, I am a professional live streamer. I do this for a living, and I got that completely wrong. <laughs> All right, let's switch keyboards. Right, I didn't do this yesterday. I didn't actually switch keyboards. But I'm going to switch and put the ARM keyboard in front of me so that I can actually focus and use the appropriate keyboard on the appropriate device here to make it a little bit easier so I don't get confused. There were a number of times yesterday where we were writing code and I dropped into, um, I, I dropped into, uh, uh, in, into my AMD x86 x64 machine using its keyboard when I thought it was an arm, and it was, I, it confused the heck out of me. Um, um, okay, <clears throat> here we go. So we are working on a project called TagZap. TagZap is an application that makes it easier to discover content on social media using hashtags. 
we've turned this into something that's going to be a little bit more effective and a little bit more fun for live streamers to use to integrate into their their content. We have integrations for uh, Twitter, for Mastodon, YouTube live chat. Um, we, we've even got custom website hookups, search YouTube uh, videos for hashtags. Um, and we were almost done a Blue Sky provider that allows you to bring in content from Blue Sky. Really cool stuff. Um, I don't know, chat room, do you think I should work, keep working on the Blue Sky or should I work on the Blazer bits today? I'm, I'm kind of at a fork here because I've got two bull requests. I started down the Blue Sky stuff. You know what? I, I don't have a way to get the screen name right now out of Blue Sky. Um, let's provide that little bit of feedback here to um, to the Fishy Flip project. We got a great bit of sample code here to help us get the profile picture. Got that uh, loaded up. And also to get the link through to the user's profile, but we don't have the screen name. Um, uh, this worked great for me in Tags app, but I am still uh, uh, looking for a way to capture the screen name of the uh, actor who posted the message. I can get their display name. Let me use the the property that they reference here, display name. But I'd also like to fetch their um, yeah screen name, like um, right at csharpfritz.com. in my case. So, um, great feedback, great support from Drastic Actions in helping us use um, their library called Fishy Flip that makes it a, a, a heck of a lot easier to work with the Blue Sky API. Um, nice tool set, happy to bring that in, provide some feedback, and, and I wanna help write some documentation and push some of that information back to their project to help out and, and improve that. So I, I feel like the blue sky provider, because it's listening to, because it listens to the fire hose, it's listening to every message go by. I feel like we, we can't run this single threaded. We, we need to listen and push those messages off into a queue somewhere as quickly as possible so that we're able to to listen and not miss any messages because messages are flowing by and we need to be able to pick those off and send them along so um so i think that's a little bit of work that we we need to do here um so let's add that little bit of feedback here um need to consider uh multi-threading the uh, review of the Blue Sky um, fire hose. Uh, messages are being missed while processing. Uh, yeah, just while processing. Let's just leave it at that. So so we've got that note on there so we can remember to, to pursue and investigate a little bit further. Fishbelly on Twitch says, I haven't ever played with Blazor. The front ends you've done with .NET or MVC. In my opinion, what's the best way to become familiar with Blazor as an MVC developer? Um, so, as an MVC developer, have you done Razor pages? Blazor takes the component capabilities of... Um, and, and really turbocharges them. So there's, I, I think there's, there's a path there because you know how to write 
Razer templates, you're going to get about 80% into Blazor. There's some syntax around data binding. There's a syntax shift in how you write functions and some of the interactions that you need in order to set up the application. The user interface bits, you already know how to do. You already know how to do most of that. The data binding, the inline code, um, and, and how you set up pages and routing are the only places where I think you're going to need to spend some time. And even then, you're going to pick them up quickly because they, they're purposely designed to make sense for us as .NET developers. When you see them, you're going to go, oh, yeah, I already know how to do this thing. And it's just a slight syntax tweak, and it goes over there. So we're going to dive in here. You're going to see we're, we'll be migrating and doing some Blazor code. And i happy to take questions along the way here to help get you more comfortable and more aware of what's going on in Blazor. A, the AMA tag is lit up here on Twitch. If you're on YouTube, ask me anything. Happy to pause and take those questions. Like this one from Loco. Um, motivated to do some mobile app, minimum viable product development. Cool. Um, Loco's used to JavaScript, PHP, and Python, but I'd like to give it a try with .NET MAUI. Great. Objectively, do I think it's mature enough to build it with? Um, with without to build it without for me to dying. Um, would I have to learn C sharp for that? You do not need to learn C sharp because you could do a Blazor hybrid application where you can embed an entire JavaScript HTML application inside of a Maui app, and it will manage a what we call a web view for you. And you, you can build that way. It's not going to be as high performance as native code. But if you're building just a little data snacking app, nobody's going to notice. They're not going to notice a performance difference. That said, if you want to go further to integrate with other, um, other hardware sensors, features on a, on a mobile device, you'll have to learn a little bit of C-sharp. You can integrate and reach across. There are APIs that are made available to you as a JavaScript programmer. They're attached to the window object inside the browser in um, Maui hybrid applications. There are many companies, organizations that do make um, mobile applications using .NET Maui. Take a look at the, uh, at the .NET Conf keynote. They particularly featured the NBC Sports app that you can get for iOS, Android, and that is built and managed with .NET MAUI. So companies that, that build with, with .NET MAUI, with Xamarin, not all of them want to be forthcoming and declare, hey, look what we're building with these tools. Um, so, it, right, there's, there's NDAs and lawyers be, that need to approve before they'll share details of a closed source application that they build and maintain and a lot of these companies are not software companies so they don't they, they don't want to share their IP because they don't understand any value in sharing their intellectual property they're that and that's the way they do business they they make their money and do their thing in other industries fine but if they do it, it, right, if they if they do decide to share some of the information about what frameworks and tools they use, it's kind of a gift to to learn that information and see what they use. I can tell you a number of finance companies, number of banks, do use Xamarin and .NET Maui now to build and manage their applications as well. So, I, but that's an industry. I'm not telling you specific ones. There's a number of customers out there that do that. You can check out uh, on dot, dot .net. That website you can find. There's a bunch of success stories that are listed out there that you can see. It is mature. There are edge level cases and scenarios that are always going to be improved and that are going to be difficult to keep up with as the phone vendors change their operating systems, change their APIs, enhance and move things around. And it's, it's a chasing scenario. So. 
However, there are APIs. If you want to build something native for iOS or Android, you can bring those in and call and interact with them directly from .NET MAUI. Um, you think the, the M365 admin and the Intra ID admin apps on iOS and, and Android are built with MAUI? Um, I don't remember. You might be right. The Azure app is built with .NET MAUI. So, um, yeah. Um, continuing. All right. So there's my notes about, about Blue Sky. Let me get back into my other pull request, and we're going to talk about building and working with Blazor. Is, there, is that another a new issue over here? Yeah, making the main modal window larger or smaller. That's a more of an accessibility thing. It's a good request. Um, we can get back into that. So um, I've been working on this for a while, a bunch of commits that I've been pushing through to do this migration from Razor Pages to Blazor. A um, lot of commits last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. User admin page, the UI customization screen, GitHub Actions, Markdown Editor. Um, yeah, I think we're... I'm getting a cold. I'm a little congested. My apologies. How you doing there, lanky Scottish nerd? Everybody's wishing me good health, and here I'm starting to get congested. What? You've been watching the commits closely? We're, we're getting there, right? So... Uh, let me open uh, my terminal window here. I'd really like to have my profile loaded, you know? Uh, but hey, whatever. Why did it take 4.3 seconds to load? Like, that's weird to me. So let's head into the Tags app uh, application over here. I'm going to check out... Um, What's the what's my branches here? Do I have it? No. Um, so let's take a look at the remote branches. Thank you so much. So I can check out and track a remote branch by calling git checkout track. Get me a copy of that fix migrate laser. So checks out creates a branch that tracks that so I can push and interact with it. Um instead of PowerShell 7. Yeah, I tried to do that and it, and it, I did the install instructions and it's not working. So not gonna fight it, not gonna go after it. Quite frankly, don't care. Um, it works just fine for me, don't care. Um, that's a place where there's documentation missing. There's installation, look. Don't give me a link here. Give me a link that does it. Just does it. Um, <clears throat> you're running into some errors for a brand new Blazor app. How are you doing there, Amal? A form field element should have an ID or name attribute. Um, um, didn't try Winget. I followed the instructions on this link, which does not say to use uh, Winget um, because you can't install with the MSI package on ARM, so you have to use the zip package. So I downloaded the zip package. I put it down in the in the place that it should be, and it doesn't work. So it's there. It just doesn't work. Um, content security policy of your site blocks the use of eval in JavaScript migrate. That. Yes, all form elements should have an ID or name attribute. <clears throat> so if you've got an input tag there, you need to have an ID or name attribute. Um, so there's that. 
Um, but you've also got an eval statement in your JavaScript. That is it is can be a, a perceived security issue. Um, and you're doing something with cookies. I need to see more of your code. That is not that, that is not the out of the box application. At least I did a file new template and file new blazer and I don't see those. So I'm not quite sure what you're hitting there. I, I need a little bit more context. Um, look at this. Eric's writing a, a method here to go get values for card ranks and suits. Yes. Yes. Right. That's exactly the kind of code that we're going to see and write in this C-sharp series. Yes. So, um, something that, that I hope I hope you viewers out there appreciate when I build work with a new tool new operating system the first things that I do are follow their instructions to the to a T to a the, the letter of exactly what those instructions are and and skip right into them and if they don't work provide that feedback um, and then I will go and, and hack and change and move things around so that it does work the way that I want it to. So, no, PowerShell, PowerShell 7 does not install with the instructions that are given on ARM. Similarly, we didn't, we weren't able to get, um, Docker installed and running because Docker desktop does not run on ARM. However, Docker for Linux does work. So, it, I'm okay with troubleshooting, but I need some more syntax. Can I install through Windows Store? Can I install what? Docker? Um, no. Because I'm on ARM. Really? Also, I can't install Developer Home. I can't install a uh, subsystem for Android. No. So it's not there. Can't do it. So I have it installed and running in Ubuntu. Um, ah, shoot. What was the command to get it running? <coughs> we had this running. Um, <laughs> I had it running yesterday. Install Docker, not Duker, on, um, uh, WSL. So, yeah, it was running just fine. It, there's a configuration things here. I did just summon Robert Tables. You're right. You're right. Grep doesn't work. Uh, well, wait a sec. I don't think I'm going to find it. Well, there it is. It's the sudo. Right? Etsy init D nightmare. Nightmare just resubscribed for 44 months. Happy hump day. I summon a second Bobby Tables. A second Bobby Tables? I didn't know you could, it was possible to have two. Uh, failed. Uh, really? Failed because the control process exited with error code. <laughs> Mm hmm. I have no idea what this means, but sure. Um, I, I'll type that in and see what it says. Failed to start. Handy. Handy. Um, no, Microsoft does support PowerShell on ARM. 
they don't have an installer for it. There's a, a zip file there, and it tells you, unzip, put it in this location. And I did. And it didn't work. So. Um, yeah. Th this is uh, th this is wonderful. Th this is fantastic. This doesn't work. Um, right? And, yeah. So now what? What's what's it say up here in the other one? Journal CTL XEU Docker Service. Um has finished with a failure. No. That's that's great. That's that's wonderful. That makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. So we tried the command service docker start, so... So I'll remove it. Like... Right? Like... Um... Uh, all right, so back over here. And what was it? It was like WSL. It was like WSL restart or something. Oh, dear Lord. Um, not exec. Manage? No. Mount? No. Shutdown. There we go. Right? WSL dash dash shutdown. Sure. Right. And then we'll restart it. Maybe. Weird Docker works on your machine? I, I, I'm at a point where I'm not questioning why something works or doesn't work. I'm, I, I'm now at a point where it doesn't work. And that's just it. Yes, because I'm running on an ARM processor, Docker did not make a Docker desktop version that runs on ARM. So, um, all right, so now if I try that. Okay, yeah. Um, so that looks like it, it started. And there it is. But there it is. It's working over there. So I can go uh, source, tags app. Come on, finish. Really? You're not going to? Oh, dev. Dev is first. Then tags app. I know my own folder structure. See, there it is. Um, <clears throat> all right. Was a joke? Hey, that's cool. It, it, it's hard to get nuance sometimes. Um, and that's why it read it. If you make making jokes and you put an emote on it, it makes it easier for me to tell that it's a joke. Does Podman desktop? Don't know. I, I don't use Podman. I use Docker. Yeah, turn it off, turn it on, and it works. I don't know. What ding? There's a ding? I didn't hear a ding. Yes, you can connect Visual Studio Code to this interface. But why? So... Um, I'm going to be working over here at this command line. Actually, can I just do this? Hey, that's fancy. All right, so let's do that. And th th this is going to take 30 seconds to boot my, whatever, to boot my profile. So, um, all right, so now if I go CD dev and now I don't want to be. Navigating this drive has been really slow. It's really slow, not gonna lie. Right? Um, so we have a tags app blazer application here. There it is. So uh, let's do a .NET watch. See if we can get that up and running and start taking a peek at the blazer version of this application. 
and get this working. Uh, might be worth checking out Podman. Functions the same, a little more open source friendly. No, I cannot create a dev drive. PowerShell freak. Nope, because this machine, this Windows install, will not upgrade past the 2021 version of Windows 10. So, yeah. Um, and just to show, right, we are up to date as of, what, an hour ago? So we'll check for updates, see if there were any updates released in the last hour. Oh, there's a security update for antivirus. Uh, optional updates? Nothing available. So. And that antivirus update is in downloading and installing now. Fine. Go ahead and do that in the background. And uh, the current version you see, I am on Windows 21H2. So. That's as close as we're going to get. That is a mangled URL. Not, oh, see, mm, wrong keyboard. Developers, 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 developers. Um, hey there, thank you for the follow. Yeah. Uh, what's the benefits of having an ARM system for development? Um, it's supposed to be less expensive. It's supposed to be more powerful for that expense. Um, it's supposed to consume less electricity, so then you end up with a longer battery life. Those are the benefits that, that ARM folks tout. In my limited experience here, I'm also running into significant support issues from operating system applications, APIs. So, but yeah, um, it, it is supposed to be cheaper, yeah. Do I have a favorite JavaScript front-end framework? Vanilla. You're talking to a guy that's gonna be coding in Blazor today. Happy New Year, how you doing there? Uh, is it, I, I keep wanting to make sure I pronounce this right. Is it Rabu? Um, oh my goodness, Motown Andy with the resub. Motown Andy just resubscribed for 60 months. Time watch. is passing by fast smile. It is. How you doing there? Five years with us. Thank you so much. And I'll make another donation to a charity here. Much appreciate. HTMX, I... Let's see what we get here. And start it. Yeah. Connecting to the browser taking longer than expected? Probably because it's not running. Um, and we got a crash here trying to connect to... Yes, the, the database isn't... Isn't uh, running. So let's go up here. Right, Docker PSA. Yeah, let's restart that. Right, um, now Docker start. PG tags. Thank you. There it is. Now the database is running. Um, let's start up Visual Studio because I like Visual Studio. But we had a conversation about two weeks ago about the debugger in Visual Studio. And a lot of folks, it sounds like, have only looked at Visual Studio as just a glorified text editor and navigation and haven't really explored the debugger in there. I think that's a series of videos that when I get back to work next week, which sounds weird, get back to work because I work here. Like, I'm finishing my 10th year. Th this is year 10 working for Microsoft. November, we celebrate my 10-year anniversary working for Microsoft. Um, so I've always worked from home. Like, so it's not really going to an office, per se, right? Um, thanks. Thanks so much. I appreciate you. Open that thing over there and whatever. Let me go into app settings and let's yank some of this stuff so we can uh, get our... 
get our configuration launching here. Yeah. Shut up. I want to go through the new configuration process, if you don't mind, because we did build a nice little startup wizard to help you configure your database and choose and start things properly. Corey Weathers. How you doing there, Corey? Um, great to see you. And, and we, we had started a conversation just before the holiday break, the year end break. I want to make sure that we don't forget that and get back together. Great to see you. How you doing there? Um, look at the love for Corey. I love seeing that. Um, let's drop a shout out for our friend there. There we go. Make sure you check out Corey and the great folks that he's working with. Um, working with some web GPU stuff, James. That's cool. Debug is one of the first things you teach trainees. SV4, S4P0. <clears throat> is, is that pronounced some way? Is that Sapo or something? Let me know. On YouTube, Jeremiah says they used to think that Visual Studio was bloated and heavy. Right, I get that. I hear that from a lot of folks. So why would you use it over Visual Studio Code? Then I learned to use the debugging tools. Yes, it's a world of difference then, isn't it? And it's quite underrated. <laughs> Napalm's cursing Python, right? Um, you're still on that job hopping phase every two years. I was about every two, three. The longest place, uh, longest I was at any place before I started at Microsoft was four years. And they literally laid me off minutes before I was turning in my resignation because I was going to work at Telerik. They, they laid me off minutes before and I had a golden parachute. <laughs> um, so the story goes like this. Before we get into this, here, story time. Let's, let's back over here. Um, I was working for a small startup company and I was a, a number of, of headhunters, a number of recruiters in the area um, were trying to recruit me because I, I was becoming well known because um, I was speaking at the local user group, but recruiters were trying to hire, get me to come work for their company. Well, I had a recruiter bring me in, get me very interested, offer me 30% pay increase to come join a company. I would get to lead a team, be an architect. I was being blocked from advancing my career at the startup that I was working at. And that's, look, it's a startup. They're not focused on advancing your career. They need to make money and sell the product. I get it. But I was at a point in my in my life where my, my second child was two, three years old, and I was looking and saying, hey, let's let's advance the career here. I want to move forward. And I found a company that was going to do that and help me advance my career. So I I agreed to to join them in word, in vocally, orally, agreed to it. Went back to the company I was working at, the startup, and I said, you know what? I want to advance my career. I have a career opportunity over here. Here's the pay that, that I'm going to see over there. I'm going to go over and join that company. And the startup was flabbergasted. They were not happy. They really wanted to keep me because they had several projects that they wanted to get done. And I was a key piece of delivering those. And if they lost me, the time that it would take them to hire somebody new at my level to come in and ramp up and complete the project, literally, they would fail the project, they would not be able to complete and deliver and meet their goals. Consequently, their their board and folks would withdraw money, look at selling the company off. They were at a pivot point there. So I said to them, okay, here's what, what the other company has pitched me. And here's the research I've done on folks that accept um, that, that accept a competing offer to stay at their current organization. According to these HR statistics and bureaus and consulting companies, folks that accept a counter offer to stay at their current employer end up leaving within the first year. Either the company dismisses them or they depart on their own somewhere else. So, if I'm going to accept your counter offer, I want you to put in writing that if you dismiss me before one year from today, you're going to give me three months pay. No questions asked. I said, we would never do that. We would never dismiss you. I said, then there's no problem in signing that on, on the document, is there? 
If you're never going to going to do that, if you truly believe that, then this shouldn't be a question. You're right. And, and signing that, putting putting my name on that piece of paper, and them putting their name on that piece of paper to agree to it was something that felt good at the time. Fast forward and seven, eight, nine months later, project was getting finished. Things weren't feeling too well with some of the analysts and salespeople. And at the same time, I had Telerik Software interested in hiring me away. So for folks who are looking at moving your career forward, it's okay to negotiate and talk to other companies about advancing your career. Have a purpose and a reason that you're doing that, not just, I'm taking the bigger paycheck. I'm advancing my career because that means there's stability there. There's a role, there's a purpose that you're moving into. I took the counter offer to stay at the company, the startup that I was at, because they needed to complete a project. As we were completing the project, I saw cracks in the business model. Telerik was, point, was poking around and said, hey, do you want to come work for us? They even flew me out to meet with them. And they offered me more money to come join them and change my career from being a team lead developer to being developer advocacy, developer relations. I took that job. As, it, as, as I came back from my vacation, because I flew to Boston to meet with the office, walked in as I'm going to walk in the front door, my manager is there meeting me at the front door. Hey, how's it going there, Ralph? Great to see you. You know, it, you know, it, see you stopped at Starbucks on the way in here, picked up some donuts and whatnot. How's things going? You know, it, very nice of you to pick up coffee and donuts for the team. He said, well, let's step over here in the front conference room. I want to talk to you about a couple things real quick. Yeah, sure. No problem. Walked into the front, front conference room. There's the CFO and the head of HR sitting there. Documents laid out on, on the conference room table. You're being laid off. Okay. Um, reached into into my backpack, pulled out that signed piece of paper and said, okay. Um, I'm assuming this is still in effect then. To which they looked at it and they went, oh no. They weren't going to give me any, they were going to give me two weeks severance. I got three months. I started the next week at Telerik, working from home. And I had, I, I didn't just get a Christmas bonus. I got three months severance in November. Yeah. So I wouldn't say got him, but, um, what I want to make sure that, that folks that are early in your career, I want to make sure that you hear accepting a counter offer is not something that you should do lightly. Protect yourself. Most folks, you, you can find the articles out there searching on different HR consulting websites. Most folks will be dismissed or part on their own. And there, it was open-ended on my side in that document. I could leave if I wanted to. That's actually an at-will employment thing here in Pennsylvania. They, they, I couldn't have signed and said, I will not leave. But, um, I, I, be aware as you're negotiating and changing jobs. Everything is negotiable in your career, okay? From the number of vacation weeks that you have, from the amount of pay that you get, the amount of, the amount of, ownership stock holding consideration that you have everything is negotiable okay our careers are a means to an end they're not your life they're not a prison you're not chained to work at a desk for somebody okay you have the flexibility to go and do the things that you want so same happened to you yeah so it's Watch out for signing bonuses. They can be nice in some companies. They use it as a lure. So they, so the major tech companies will offer signing bonuses. However, some of them have conditions on them that you need to be aware of. 
And it doesn't hurt if you have a lawyer friend, if, if you have somebody who works in the HR that's a friend of, of yours, it doesn't hurt to have somebody review that information. Yeah, that's right, clawback clauses. Yes, they are common, okay? Where if something happens and in the first two years, you and that company part ways, they can try to get back some percentage of that sign-on bonus. There are some companies that will give you sign-on stock and it doesn't vest immediately, okay? Digital drama just Be aware of that. For 16 months. Don't think that you are just immediately, you've got this pay and you can work with it, okay? Some companies will, they'll pull a fast one in how they pitch you the sign-on bonus. Example, if you sign on with this company, your base pay is going to be about what you're making now. But we're going to give you a sign-on bonus that is, I'm going to make up numbers here, $50,000 with, with clawback terms over the next two years. So if you leave within the next two years, you owe a percentage of that back. And we're going to give you $100,000 in stock that vests over the next two years. So if you stay over the next two years, you're not being paid $100,000, whatever your base salary is. You're being paid over those two years, $100,000 in year one, $100,000 in years two, and another $150,000 in bonus across both. So where you would only get $200,000 from your current role for this year and next year, maybe a little bit more next year because of bonus, merit increase, what have you, you're actually getting $350,000. But here's what they're not telling you. If something happens and the market changes and you leave before them, instead of you leaving and finding the next company and maybe you get hired on at the same rate, $100,000, you didn't just leave. You left and you didn't get severance and you got that money clawed back. So the rest of that $100,000 of stock that was supposed to vest, you never got. The rest of that $50,000 of bonus, sign-on bonus, is being clawed back from you. Yeah, it was given to you day one, but they're trying to get it back from you now. And you're going to get a nice letter from a lawyer saying, hey, you owe us $25,000 or whatever that percentage might be. Be aware. Because also what happens when you get into year three, well, in year three, now you're being paid $110,000 and no bonus, no stock. Guaranteed, no bonus, no stock guaranteed. Now you're being paid less than you would have been paid if you stayed at the company you were at. Be aware. All right, they're playing mind games with you. And if you look, if you look at folks in the tech, high profile folks in the tech industry, they change jobs every two years. Look at their LinkedIn. This is public information. Are they changing because those sign on bonuses ran up? Maybe. But you can clearly see patterns where folks leave after a year two years and it's not just eh, 25 26 months eh, 13 months no it's 12 months it's 24 months to the month to the day these people change jobs read into that what you will i know what i've read into it um four-year vest might be 15 15 40 40 right avari right yes yes um, government isn't perfect, no. How you doing there, LibVM? Thank you so much for the follow. Digital Drummer J with the resub there. Thank you so much. I'll make another charity donation. Non-Fat Burrito. Appreciate the follow a couple minutes ago. Hello, hello. Welcome. Uh, how you doing there, Sean? How is ARM and Windows working today? We're having... We're, it's working quite well. We've got the Blazor app rerunning here, and we're going to go step through it. We're pausing here to just to talk about some career growth things. Uh, James on Twitch mentions guaranteed minimum years on a contract is better than a sign-on bonus if the bonus is rolled into pay. I like the way you're thinking there. I like the way you're thinking there. Yes. Um, right? Because that, that clawback that they may, might try to do 
unless you put some percentage of that bonus in savings or in some sort of an investment where you can pull it back, it's not really a bonus, is it? So, there you go. All right. And I, I do agree about guaranteed minim, minimum contract. Um, minimum years on a contract. So many folks in tech do not have contracts. Even even the, the high profile folks that, that I work with do not have contracts. They have employment agreements, not contracts. A little bit different. Thank you, Robert Tables. Appreciate the help with the moderation there. Um, you're welcome, uh, Jedi1VB. Hello. Is it supposed to be Jedi VB? So, yeah, it, it, there's, I think there's evil, and then there's also folks that are so penny wise, pound foolish. So, come on. You know what this is. Nope. Didn't pick it up. Try that hat command again. Not sure. That, yeah, I'm getting a object reference error. Try that hat command. You know what? Yeah. Yeah, it just took a picture. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. There you go. College Football Hall of Fame hat. Ah, we got it. Thank you, friends. Um, non competes. Uh, yes, they are unenforceable. Non-competes are for your typical developer are not enforceable. Executives, folks that have patented technologies, and those patent patents have been signed over to organizations and most tech companies that you, that you would work for, you've signed over your patents. It's in the it's in the agreement, um, unless you negotiated something different. It's kind of boilerplate text in software developers' employment agreements. You you sign over your patents to the employer. Um, how you doing there, Thin Doll? Um, so, what you what you might see as somebody trying to enforce a non compete? Great example. Amazon has very extensive non competes in their contracts. Folks are quite vocal about this. Because Amazon has such a wide series of businesses that they run in, they will try to stop you. If you left Amazon as a software developer and you went to try and get a job at Walmart as a store manager, they will attempt to block you using non-compete. And they have done this. They've attempted to block folks. And it, it's... It's unenforceable. It's a scare tactic. So. Um, <clears throat> Certainly, Dev applied for a job once, and the contract said they owned anything I wrote, even out of work hours. I've gotten that. I've gotten that bit of a contract modified. I have pushed back on all of my employers about that, and Microsoft has very clear... Um, verbiage around that in their contracts, uh, employment agreements. I got to make sure I use the right term here. Um, if you are not using the company property, you're not using their hardware, you're not using their software, and you build something on your own personal software, hardware, what have you, you should have right to it. And it and most companies will fold if you challenge them on those terms. Most will. Those that do not and want to have full ownership of everything that you think of, don't work there. Don't. There's something else going on there that you don't want to be a part of. You wrote a really neat NuGet package at work and you'd really like to make it open source. Any advice on approaching this with the boss? Um... I would recommend proving out that it's not central to your intellectual property or a, or a differentiator for your organization. Is it something that helps the rest of the tech community and that other folks can contribute to that will in turn help your organization? Show that community growth potential by making that package available to other folks. 
Um, I've been through that negotiation at the startup that I was at prior to Telerik, the one that laid me off. Um, and uh, let them know, write a, a nicely worded document that shows, here's the benefits of open sourcing it. This isn't central to our intellectual property, to our business model, but open sourcing this and getting other folks to help with it benefits us getting security validation, getting quality assurance from other organizations benefits us because we don't have to write and manage those things. That's good reasons to open source. Uh, yes, in California, non-competes are not allowed. Yep. So, he was on 50-50 time. You might have some challenges there on licensing and releasing that. So, um, how's that enforceable working on things after hours? It, it, they will enforce it. They will try. And it's, developers, it's something that you can developers, fight back against. But as, as a typical rank and file developer, you don't want to hire a lawyer. They'll drown you and bully you with a lawyer, that, even though they don't have standing on that. I am not a lawyer. Your state's laws might be different. Your country's laws might be different. In Pennsylvania, I've run into organizations that have threatened, particularly there were organizations where software was not their top business. Pharmaceutical company, finance company. And I was writing software for them. And they wanted, right, the, it was a boilerplate contract because the, the scientists that worked at the pharmaceutical company they wanted to be able to get notes and things and, and discoveries that folks made while they were working on a project outside of same thing with the finance companies. Oh, well you had these, the, these trading strategies and whatnot that you developed on your own on the side. Well, while you were working with us, but you work for us in designing, trading, building financial models, those belong to us, that type of thing. Doesn't really work with software. Um, source gen for signal our clients. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, you're, you're going to need to go through a little bit of discussion and a release of that intellectual property because technically they own it since you use company property. Not, not hard to do. We've been quite successful doing that. And now we have legal teams at Microsoft that are well versed in doing that. And they're familiar with it and they, they appreciate that. And they know how to go through this process, and they've got a little bit of, a little bit of a standard that they've gone through. Not, not saying that it's easy to do, but they've got a process that w they can work through. You, you need to kind of document and show the benefit of open sourcing it, and that you aren't going to be responsible. Your and your organization is not going to be responsible for bug fixes on it. You need to really make clear that that license contains things that say that it's provided as is, right? And that'll that'll help to ease some of the uh, concerns that non-tech companies might have. So, all right, let me head back over. Let, let's dive back in here and get working on this Blazor application. Here we are. There's the first start configuration. We wrote this a little bit ago um, to get this working. I have a Postgres provider out here. I deleted the connection string in here, didn't I? Um, there it is. That's the connection string. Localhost. There's a port. There's the the whole shoot and match, right? Um, right. So I'm gonna copy that connection string and I'm gonna try and. You're not gonna let me control Z and undo. Control Z doesn't work. Oh, whatever. So there's my connection string. I probably should break up connection strings so it's a little bit easier for non-technical folks. I clicked start and here it goes. So it's actually restarting the application and trying to reconnect. So what happened? Why it browser debug proxy has an error, unable to load the requested types. Really? It says the application started. There it is. There we go. So, feeling good about that. Why in GitHub? No, I don't use JavaScript more than C Sharp. GitHub's for everybody. 
Yes, I built the setup wizard myself. That's why it's so broken. <laughs> so, hey, tick, tick, boom, right? So, <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Um, let me pause here. This is a, a, a comment on on Twitch. I want to make sure that that I don't lose here. Let me grab this from on. Is it on dry sec? Um, ooh, that's a it's a long one there. Maybe folks that have bigger screens, you might be able to see it a little bit easier. Really enjoy the stream and introduction to the Microsoft ecosystem. Thanks so much. Um, yesterday I presented to my supervisor reasons to start the development of a new project in .NET and not in ASP Classic. Oh man, ASP Classic. That's that's an ecosystem that's been around for 25 years. Still supported on IIS on Windows, but I, I, I agree with you to kind of move things along here. Um, but I'll continue. You're trying to, you're hoping you get the green light totally. Um, because you started to make APIs in .NET in your spare time and you really like how simple it is. That's great. Oh my gosh. Everything is awesome. Love it. Yes, yes. Um, it, if, if there's any discussion, concerns you have there, you want to, you, you need some feedback on there. Let us know. I'm, I'm sure there's other folks here in chat that have gone through similar discussions and, and let's, let's try and get you successful in moving your project forward to, um, a, a more modern stack. So, um, Let's see, James says, talking to companies in open source usually, yeah, it, it can scare some folks to, to contribute and, um, and, and get involved in open source. It can be a little scary for folks. Yeah, even Microsoft has, has documents that say, new projects, let's move to modern.net, .net 7, .net 8, .net framework and earlier, we don't recommend folks start new projects there because there's so many benefits performance security new machine learning feature features that you have with the the modern .NET stacks um if you may if you write asp classic do they still make people there wear a tie to work oh brigglesworth um <laughs> uh, did mozart use asp classic <laughs> I see where you're going with that. Uh, no, it, it was actually Bach. Bach wrote in ASP Classic. <laughs> um, so here we go, right? I had a brand new Docker container that we started up, got it running, and, and I have my application here. So this should be, well, that's not going to work. Let's fix some bugs, shall we? There's no content that it's trying to copy over. Hmm. And and put in here. All right. Uh, this is in Waterfall Razor. Let's see if we can go fix that. So um, I don't have Karnak installed here. There are lots of folks that make internal that make internal applications on .NET 4.8. Yes. Um, so let me go to my waterfall page, waterfall razor, and I'm going to zoom in just a smidge here to make sure that the font is big enough for folks that are watching on a smaller device. Um, and this was right there. Okay. Um, you've had companies not want you want to allow you to install open source software because they thought it wasn't secure. But then again, you're also using Visual Studio Code, .NET, and other open source technologies. Right. There's there's a an education process there that we have to go through with some of the um, some of the the more seasoned folks that we work with, the wiser, older generation, and to make sure that they're aware that open source is a good thing. Even for massive legacy monoliths, it's worth the upgrade to an LTS on the core train. Totally agree. Performance is very good. You're right, Avari. Very, very. Uh, yeah. Uh, things like WinForms WPF have not really moved over to .NET 5 and later, which is one of the big reasons for 4.8 still being 
Um, really, Tick Tick Boom? Um, it's completely compatible. And there's an upgrade wizard that will migrate you over there. So, if there are folks struggling with that, let us know. Let, let us, the .NET team, know. We want you to be able to do that because you'll be able to do single executable deployment, faster performance, tree shaking, linking, um, all kinds of great new features that are available in WinForms and WPF, which should be compatible in .NET 8. You've still got some stuff on .NET Framework due to packages that still haven't been updated. That is, is the gap, um, Jeremiah, that I do see. There are old legacy packages, libraries that aren't on .NET Standard and .NET Core. Here's the secret, though. There is an application compatibility layer baked into .NET Core that might be able to run some of those things. Might. No guarantees. Might be able to get it to go. Pieces of uh, power toys use WPF on .NET 8 and run on ARM. Yes. Right? Um, are there Microsoft tools that still use WinForms? Um that are part of the base Windows operating system, yes, and they are migrating. The trick with that is when things ship with Windows, they need to be supported for the duration of Windows. So there's tricky licensing issues there that, that are going on that need to be worked out to get things migrated. Um, it feels odd. Okay. Okay. Really isn't a reason. Yeah, there there isn't a reason to move things to .NET 8. Give it a try, and, and where do you see the performance? Motown Andy's using ASP Classic at their workplace. Web Forms, yeah. Yeah, you're going to be there. And now Blazor, nice. It took forever for Bouncy Castle to move over. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, Claire's, Claire's done a lot of work on Bouncy Castle and some other NuGet things. Um, she's been quite busy and a, and a valuable member of the .NET community getting some of those things moving. Um, for a newbie, what would I recommend? Rider or Visual Studio? Visual Studio, because you can get a free copy of it. Rider is a paid product. Um, so... Um, you heard about Fotino.net. Not familiar with Fotino. Looks promising for those stuck doing local application, but wanting to use web apps. Lightweight open source. Okay. I'm not familiar with that. Never heard of that. Um, is that why we have the old control panel? I don't know. I'm not familiar with what tools Windows uses to build. Um, for you, Rider is also free. Really? Okay. Visual Studio is built and advances with the technology because it's built by the same team. Um, you can choose whatever tool you like. I work on Visual Studio, so I prefer Visual Studio. Yeah, if you're if you have student licensing, yeah, you can get Writer for free. <clears throat> and if you are anybody that's learning, not just a student, anybody that's learning or you're a hobbyist developer, you can get Visual Studio Community Edition for free. At Dev Intersection, you heard about Fotino? Um, hmm, okay. I'm not familiar with that. No. So, all right. Let me, let's let let's jump back in here. And, and I was looking at this line of code is not working. The waterfall head content. That should have loaded properly because there is, I mean, if there isn't any, no, there isn't any, right? Invalid sequence contains no elements. Okay, well, what happens if I just write out waterfall content, right? Let's just do that. So I have .NET Watch running here, so it's rebuilding and running, and I hit, I hit the error again. Sequence contains no elements. That's odd. Uh, okay. So 
that should be converted here. Well, let's write the content directly then. Like, let's just... And... Sequence contains no elements. What? <clears throat> Is it something else and we're just... It's something else. It's a link enumerable first while building the render tree. It's somewhere else on this page. It's a value task getting a result. All right. So let's walk that all the way back. So if we comment that out and just say no all right let's keep commenting out code here and see where it is um oh i can't do i wanted to use my my tmux hotkeys here to navigate around um back over here <clears throat> So it did run, it did run that. Excuse me, oh my goodness. Oof. Um, let me see here. Oof, we're at 11.13 and we've got nowhere today. Um, let's turn this off. <clears throat> yep, go ahead, restart the app. Um, on YouTube, Amal asks, uh, can I please brief the app, Tags app, how different parts of code are working together and how can I set this up? I'm actually going to be recording a, a dedicated YouTube video about five to ten minutes long about Tags app and how folks can get started. Um, some friends who run the dev talk show are actually building a dev container configuration so anybody can start up. And, and get running with this, provided there aren't ugly errors in the middle of it. Um, but we'll definitely talk about it. Um, you're on YouTube, check the description just below. There's a link to it, and it describes what the application is, what it does. Excuse me. There's lots more documentation that needs to be written, and it's something that, that we can get to, we can contribute to. If you out there, one of you out there that have been watching, if you want to contribute, you want to get your name on the list of contributors, and if you watched .NET Conf, I read every contributor's name as part of .NET Conf. Every contributor to TagZap was recognized as part of a Microsoft .NET conference. If you want to contribute, you can, you can help out writing a little bit of documentation to, so that other folks can ramp up, happy to take um, to, to take discussion and and push that forward a bit. You're hoping the new copilot makes its way to Rider. Um, I thought they did put copilot on Rider. Um, what are the differences between community and pro? Um, there really aren't any. It's it's licensing strictly. Um, so, and basically everybody, as long as you're not running a business, everybody can use Visual Studio Community. The minute you use Visual Studio Community as part of a business, there are min there are maximum sizes of that business, and it's like gross income of, of $3 million and 
some number of employees and some number of developers and some number of copies of Visual Studio. Once you exceed one of those values, then you need to convert to professional edition. It's a little bit confusing, but um, not hard to see why once you get past a little bit of the startup growth for using Visual Studio, they want you to start paying for it. And even then, if you're a startup company, there are startup programs that Microsoft has available that you can apply to, and they will very generously not just give you Visual Studio Enterprise for free, but they'll give you tens of thousands of dollars of Azure credits if you sign up and register as a startup with them. You can take a look at those on, I think it's azuremicrosoft.com. Um, what do I think? What is the best startup product? Visual Studio Code. Um, and I know folks, look, I know folks kind of adverse to taking in and, and paying for products um, when there's open source free tools available. Yeah, there are. There's open source and free tools available out there that you can use, and you can use .NET for free at the command line in your favorite editor in Visual Studio Code for free and, and deploy and run that anywhere you want. Build, put it in a container, run it in your own data center, run it on an IoT device, run it in your favorite cloud service, run it on a hosting service. You can do that for free. You can't do that with some other competing technologies. If you want a better developer experience than what's offered for free, there are paid tools, libraries, and features that you can get. But there is a very generous set of tools and features that you can get for free. Not the chat part. Well, uh, come on. They just released it yesterday. Like, GitHub is part of Microsoft. Do you think they're going to give a competitor features before the parent company? <coughs> Live testing is not available in community. That's a difference in enterprise and community. Um, yeah, the, the startup programs, thank you, tick, tick, boom. The startup programs are insanely good. There are different ones available. I'm, I'm purposely being a little obscure about what they are because I don't know firsthand what they all are. I, I haven't worked with them in a while, but there are very good ones available. Arantheon, thank you so much for the resub. Five months with us. Visual Studio Code, uh, Jed finds really good for searching for text in files and folders. It is, yes. Um, let's see. Copilot chat is pretty good. Blah, 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 blah. Um, <laughs> if what is paid? Visual Studio Code is... If, if GitHub Copilot chat is paid? Yes, but... They can offer to support to who they want. Their business. They don't have to offer support to everybody. They can make those choices. How they do business, right or wrong, that's their choice. I don't work for GitHub. I like using GitHub. I've been a paid I was a paid GitHub user as early as 2011. I don't pay for it anymore because I work for the company. I work for the parent company. But how they, what tools, features they decide to integrate with is up to them. So, um, tick tick boom says on owning a tech startup. Um, on the Microsoft Startups program has been incredibly useful and once on board it mainly is about being honest and open to progress. Nice. The new stage is cool. There are other extensions that can do similar to the live testing. Yes, NCrunch is really good. It is a paid extension though. NCrunch is a paid extension. They've done a great job with that extension maintaining it literally for more than 10 years. Um... I think it's a great extension. Check it out. I'm still hitting this sequence contains no elements issue here. Um, and it's it's really not clear where it is. And it's still on this 
markup string waterfall content. And if I, right, it, it, it's not executing any code now. So, right, if I comment this out, right, and let that rerun, no, it still doesn't run. And there's, this is definitely a stumbling point in Blazor. Error handling and tracking here. There's a, uh, there's a first, a link first command that's being called there. Um, yes, that was it. Copilot, you're a genius. Right? I think I could say that, right? Okay. Can I uncomment you? Uh, no, I was trying to go down here. And let's uncomment some of these. There it is, rebuilding. Come on, come on. Because the waterfall UI can't display anything if there is no tags being tracked here. There we go. All right. All right, so there it is. Um, how to accept the Copilot recommendation? Tab. Tab or enter would go through it. Uh, Dion, that's a good question that I've heard folks talk about. Let's let, let's absolutely. I'm going to touch on this. A great question. Thank you for asking this. Should junior and and middle developers use Copilot? Uh, you might call them like a de software engineer too, right? You hear folks with that role. I think so. Um, because what you can do, right? So let's go back to that code that was suggested right here, right? It suggested this code to me. Why? Here's what I can do. I can do alt forward slash. I could double check that copilot is in here and working because I'm trying to ask it a question. There it is, it's installed. So why aren't you working, my friend? Right? Where's where's the copilot window? Um copilot. Yes, enable globally. Uh is disabled. N no. Is enabled. Okay. I thought it was alt forward slash was the hotkey. Uh, hotkeys. Hang on. Or is it shortcut keys? <clears throat> Why am I going over here? No. Uh, change them. That's what I want. Um. Control Alt Enter. I thought it was Alt Forward Slash. Um. All right, Control Alt Enter. Whatever. And no, those are the solutions. I want to. I want the. Is it because I don't have the chat one turned on? Um. Yeah, install that one. See, look, folks are trying to install ChatGPT with this as well. Yeah, I think that's the one I needed. Um, you can do forward slash forward slash to give Copilot a direction. Give me one second here. We're going to get in and show you this. Um, it says it's installing, so what are you doing? I love, and I love the double scroll bar. That's, that's nice. You don't see that everywhere. 
That that's a professional designer feature right there. Can can you can you hear the sarcasm dripping off of me? Um, it says it's still trying to install. Uh, what are you, what are you what are you doing? Is it it? I don't see anything. Um. Oh, good. Look, Windows is up to date, even though it's two years old. Yes, Copilot is a great teacher, and I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to show that. Um, you should be able to highlight and do Alt forward slash, and it's not. Let's go back to the extensions. <coughs> is it over here now? No. So Copilot has an update. Okay, go ahead, do the update. I'd, I'd like to installed, but what are you doing? Uh, yeah, I want to do the inline. There's an inline question, and you can ask it. <clears throat> uh, tell me what this is. I would have thought it would have prompted me to close Visual Studio. At least that's what it does on my other machine. Hey, yes. It didn't prompt me to restart. You've seen the double hamburger menu, Jeremiah. Yes, I've seen that also. Yep. Oh, uh, yes, please make, make updates. Please do. It doesn't prompt you on your work desktop. Oh no, I, I get prompted. Oh yeah. And that's kind of the way it should. Um Where is it? Well, we're waiting. Take it one step at a time. Identify the problem. Yes. Fix it. Oh, okay. We'll do that. Hold on to your butts. It's installing. Um. So. And then? Um, and then we'll let this install, and then we will finish him. Right? Huh? So, oh, I'm done my coffee. I just put coffee mugs on the floor next to me. It's like, I don't want them on my desk. Because I, I end up knocking them over, and I've broken a couple mugs that way. Now we'll go to Alani. Yay, Alani. So uh, we're we're waiting. We're waiting. Um. Okay. Whatever. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. What? I just got to notice that the president's coming to my town. Um, sure, right, whatever. This, finishing up, you still got like a quarter of the way to go there, friend. Um. <clears throat> um.
Hmm. Okay. Whatever. Whatever. Um. Come on. <clears throat> you haven't heard the Philly.net hat story? It kind of disappeared for a while. And we found it. So. Um, okay, so. Restart Visual Studio. I should pin that to the taskbar. I don't, what is this thing? I don't know what this is. Chat? I don't, I don't know what that is. I'm not familiar with that. I don't know anybody who has it. I'm trying to right click and remove it. I'd like to remove you, please. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. And unpin from my taskbar. I'd like to right click and remove you. If I right click it faster, will you give me the con the No. But I can right click this and I can say pin to taskbar. But I can't remove you. Can I come over here and say go away? Can I say remove it? Widgets. Sure. Task view. Nah. Why can't I right click it like I can right click everything else? You pain in the kush. Kush. There we go. Nah, it looks like Teams thinks it's Teams. It's not Teams. Um, you glued a back together a mug that was sitting on your desk. High tech redneck. Oh man, does it leak at all? <clears throat> um, chat. You thought you were teams, but I was born in teams. I was. Um, hey, Copilot's now enabled. Thanks. Don't show me that again. I get it. All right, here we go. Alt forward slash. Back to the question. There it is. So now I can ask Copilot for the, the original question, rewinding about 10 minutes ago. Should juniors and mids use this? Well, I can highlight a block of text and ask, what is this doing? And it will teach you. <clears throat> it will tell you exactly what it's trying to do that's valuable right now now you're getting somewhere now we're learning how to do more with this and it's helping make you a better developer that's cool one does not simply uninstall team must uninstall the installer too. Yep. Senior developers using using Copilot means how much more code that you don't need to write. You can just kind of give it an idea, tell it what to do, and it'll just generate most of it. Tweak it, tune it. And it works. Um... All right, so <clears throat> we put that if statement around there and it automatically updated and, and deployed. So <clears throat> if there aren't any tags tracked, we should probably put some sort of a message here. Um, no tags currently tracked. Um, use the admin menu to specify a tag and eh, just use the ad eh, whatever and where's my message there it is um can we do can we do something like this uh right can we say like width uh Right, VWH, uh, 100 VWH, can we do that? And then height, uh, 100, uh, well, it's VW, isn't it? Uh, VH, 
and uh, text align something like that. No, that doesn't work. Can we make this a div? That's better. Um, and then do like vertical align middle. Right? <clears throat> and uh, that didn't do anything. Let's ask Copilot. Uh, center this div on screen. Don't you like me, Copilot? Help me, Copilot. You're my only hope. No, hope, not home. What? I'm not Dave. I'm Jeff. No, really. I'm Jeff. There, thank you. Why do you keep calling me Dave? Yes. Can you sing Daisy for me, Hal? I'm going to call you Hal now. How? Um, I'll put a div that is centered on the screen and report that no tags are being tracked. Um, let's see, we're missing a closing div. I'm going to take just what it gave me directly. Oops. And let's see what it gives me. Hey. It even, hang on. Stop. Stop everything right here. Wait a minute. Hang on. Let's... Do you see what it did there? I asked it to write a div. I even called it Hal. I asked it to write a div on the screen and report that no tags were being tracked. Not only did it put that message, but it also figured out how to use the user interface and provide that helpful bit of text that you, you saw me say, ah, it's good enough to say just no tags tracked. It generated the right helpful text to tell people how to do that. Dude. Okay. Text is a little bit large for me, but I like it. I like it. I that, uh, and, and then I'm going to just clean up the user interface a little bit. And uh, the, wow, that is a little impressive. I agree, Andy. Like, right? Are you kidding me? Oh, my. I know. Um, let's just make that instead of an H1, right? Let's make this an H3, right? Uh, what? And you want me to go to Vader mode? And you want me to go to Vader mode? Did it? I thought I made it an H3. 
What's a display one? I want to. What's a display three? All right, uh, four. I don't know what that is, but sounds good. Wow! Like, um, it updated the closing tag automatically, Dion. Yeah, it. I totally see. It, right. It, that, that's a Visual Studio thing. It it now knows if you update the opening tag, if you update the tag name, it'll update the appropriate closing tag for you. So the first time that I saw that, and, and that's a recent thing, the first time I saw that, I kind of was I, I was startled. Like, really? Really? Um, I think Display 4 is, a, is just a heading, right? If I take that class off, right? So it's just a, a heading. So, but, uh, okay, I'll take it. And, and we want me to go to Vader voice mode. You, you, you want me to go to Vader voice mode, not just pretend that I'm doing, um, that I'm doing Bane. Um, all right. All right. Um, am I using Bootstrap or some other CSS? I'm using Bootstrap. Yeah. And I know there are some folks that are very anti-Bootstrap. Um, too bad. I like Bootstrap. Give me a reason. Give me a suggestion. Give me give me some code that is not Bootstrap, that looks better. I'm happy to take it and do something with it. Um, you wanted Vader mode. Let's see. That looks like everything's plugged in and turned on. So let's see if we can do Vader. Is it? Is it going to? It didn't turn on. Oh yes. <laughs> let's Vader voice mode. Hmm. Let's write some code. Um, can I hide the, the test bar there? Can we do that? I don't need to see you and your rebel scum. Right? Uh, mm, can I hide it? Automatically hide. Yes. Good, good. All right. You're all part of the rebel alliance. And that co-pilot too. The anti-bootstrap bro. <laughs> Look, and, and there are some folks that are very anti-bootstrap. That's their opinion. That's fine. I like it. It's as a non-sophisticated designer, it helps me deliver what the Empire needs. Right? Anyways. Um okay. So we fix. We fix. There it is. We fix the page. It works. It looks good. Um, moving on. So these pages should not do anything. It's. It's really not doing anything. Um, okay. Let's just double check that. Back over here. Uh, right. Overlay. Just take a look at the overlay page. Uh, wrong one. Um, oh, did I, did I not bring it over? That, that could be... I didn't bring it over. All right, we gotta do that. Uh, you ran into code breaking issues due to tag changes. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, okay, so those pages are, aren't brought over yet. Fine. I could. I could do that real quick, can I? Right. Bring them. Bring those two pages over so they're working. Um, maybe. 
So we're moving content from Razor Pages into Laser Pages. Okay. That might sound weird, mostly because I'm in a Darth Vader voice effect. But! We'll have some fun with this. Alright. Um. Don't need that. Don't need that. No. Yes. And we probably need to do this. We probably want to do this as a Blazor server page. Server interactive. So that we can push and update the browser. Yes. So, here's the original page, and you see it uses Signal R in JavaScript. Those JavaScript rebels! Um, and, uh, yeah. A whole bunch of formatting of that content. We're gonna bring that and make that laser. So, uh, I'm just gonna copy paste. I'm just gonna copy paste. So, here I should be able to do. No. There it goes. Uh, let's call this overlay resort. Resort? Sure. And. Paste that in. Now, Razor and Blazor different, right? I can still use the page directive, and uh, this is gonna answer at slash overlay. Right? I don't really have a model. It's only a model. Get rid of that. Um, I should have a layout. Right? Like, that has a layout. Right? Layout. Layout. No. Princess Layout! No, that isn't her, is it? Vader is done. Ta ta ta. I think it's a. Oh my. Let's do a little T-Pain and auto-tune the code. Five minutes on the clock. I do like this one. This one I think is fun, right? Uh, yeah, let's do this. We don't need the JavaScript. Why? Why not? Because we're doing this with the laser. Um, there's a tag that goes with this, and there's a whole bunch of formatting. Let's go find overlay CSHTML, not CS. That tag right there. Brings in the iMessaging service and goes and finds the tag. We can do that. Bring it over. Set up some code for this page. Yep, we're gonna set up a property called tag. It's gonna need to be uh, a short get set. We need that iMessaging service injected. So we can inject iMessaging service. Yeah, SVC looks good. Um, got an extra curly brace here we don't need. On initialize, let's do that async. Thanks so much. There it is. So now it identifies. If we have any text tracked, assign it and set it up so that we can work with this. I don't need model. There's a bunch of JavaScript that's gonna go away. We're gonna make that go away. Uh, string is null or update tag. Well, tag is right there. You should should be good with tag, right? Why don't you? Yeah. Uh, model's not a thing here anymore. Uh, 
Um, what else? We need to make this server interactive because we're gonna push messages into this. We want it to update live. So, uh, render mode. This is a new feature in Blazor with .NET 8. Developer, You're not just developer, rendering developer, code developer, on a server and sending that HTML down. We're activating WebAssembly code in the browser and saying, go run everything over there. You have your choice. And with TaxApp, we're activating and running our code wherever we please. This one, we're gonna run on the server. And uh, it's not happy. Oh no. Type expected. Wow. Rebuild. Go, 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 go. Echo. Layout attribute does not contain a constructor that takes two arguments. I thought I could say layout. No. Auto render mode is pretty cool. In this case, I do want it to be on the server because I want a constant connection. I want it to update when there are changes. I want to force updates and user interface interactions. So, um, and it fixes that initial load with WebAssembly. Yes, and it's really good. It makes you think of a floating orb guiding you through a game intro. I like that. Reminds me of that, that Foo Fighters video way back in the 90s, right? Big me, big, what's it called? It's been 30 years. I forget the MTV video with, with Dave Grohl. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, why can't I make like a, a layout? No, right? I could do that. Layout. Can I do? Can I do that? Or is that is that bad? No, doesn't like that. No. Um, blazer layout attribute. Yeah, I want to turn it off. Turn it off. Um, no, 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 no. Mm, Doctor Who layout? Uh, no. Apply a layout to a folder of components? <sighs> no. Um, there goes my hero. That's part of it. Hey, Landon. Hello. Uh,. Layout none, layout null. Um, yeah, I thought I did that. Looks like we need to create an empty layout. Bummer. All right. Uh, <clears throat> all right, fine. We'll create an empty layout. That feels weird. Empty layout. And let's just create that here. <laughs> empty, empty layout dot resort. Right. Come here. Thank you. Um, right. Inherits. <clears throat> right. Layout component base. And that's it. Uh, yes, I'm, a file did change. I don't know if you know this. Rebuild. No, can't 
can't find it. Um, is it is it missing from the imports? Ugh. I don't like how this by default shows me the generated code. I've provided feedback on that, and it's nothing's happened. Um, yeah, it's not in the. Now you can find it, I bet. What? The name model does not exist in overlay. That's fine. Let's get rid of this. Maybe we... Maybe! That's nice. That's... That's actually kind of nice. Layout, not empty layout. Hmm... Beautiful. Uh, we're done with TP and mode. Back to normal, standard Fritz interacting, writing code, telling bad jokes. There we go. Um, all right. Uh, ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba. Let me see. Um, there was a reference to. Yep, there it is. Model. Right, right there. Um, I'm just going to comment that out for right now. Just to get it building. Because I like to see things built. You know? Um, yeah. <laughs> Why can't you trust an atom? I don't know, Fish Belly. Why can't you? So there's Hello World. If I click into Overlay, yay! It's supposed to be green. Why wasn't it green? Um, uh, get rid of that. Get rid of that. Right. Click that. No. Isn't that where they are? Right, dub dub root CSS site CSS. Uh, what? So this big old if statement should go away, and we just have overlay display and overlay body. Uh, yes, the blazer one. There it is. All right. Overlay body. There it should be the chroma key green color. Because they make up everything. Oh. Oh. I see what you've done there, fish belly on Twitch. <laughs> um, thanks. Yes, I do want developer tools. Open them. That's why I hit F12. Maybe you've heard of them before. Um, that's not my layout. Oh, wait a second. Oh. Um, crumbs. <clears throat> I can't do that. Even empty... <sighs> yeah. Right? Because... Yeah. Uh, it's... It's still within App Razor. Ah, darn it. And I, what the heck is... Okay, that's Test Studio. Why do I have Test Studio? <clears throat> um...
Those should already be included, so I shouldn't have to do that. That's going to be an issue. And nothing. This is the overlay. No. Rebuild. Um... Yeah, I agree about the none and the null. That feels weird. Um, sorry, we don't talk about some of the politics and stuff like that in this channel. Um, so, with respect, I'm going to purge that message. But those types of things are off-topic and we don't discuss here. And I don't care what your politics are. That's off topic and not something we're going to discuss. Um, so why isn't it? Am I like? <clears throat> why isn't it picking up and doing anything? Yeah, there were, there were, uh, I forget what state it was, but somebody saw that you could open developer tools in a browser and, and interact with the code that makes up a website and they declared it hacking and they tried to, pro they were, uh, what, they were going to try and prosecute or something? Ridiculous. Um, uneducated people, like, th th these are the same people that, that see a, a doctor give somebody medicine or or put a splint on on somebody and it and they heal after a day or two and and they call it they call it magic it's the same mentality and gosh that person that that gave that, that gave you a splint to help your your uh, your your arm or your leg and and stay straight so that you could heal properly they must be a witch no they're they're not a witch but it's the same mentality like the 1600s called go back to them and when you get back to the 1600s you can still believe that the world is flat Jed I completely agree any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic Consider if somebody came back in time from the year 2123, their advanced technology that they have, whatever it might be, would appear magical to our 2024 eyes, right? Because we're not familiar with it. We don't know what it is. Um, I don't get what's going on here and why this isn't right don't tell me this is a capitalization thing don't tell me this is a capitalization thing it's not okay so why am I not getting any content? Oh, because empty layout. Doesn't actually include any directions to output content. Ta-da. Um, okay, but I need to change the ID on the body. Hmm. Chat GPT would certainly seem magical to many people, even from the 90s. From the 80s. Gosh, that's like war games. You're talking to Joshua. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of is, isn't it? Um let's see. What else can we what else can we do here to try and improve this? 
Well, there's a head outlet inside the main layout, right? I've been talking to, to Hal. <laughs> um, there is a... Um, let's go back to Bing. Let's ask it. Um, wow, look at that. I don't, I don't, um, no, I want chat. Give me chat. Right, more precise. Yes, please. Um, in blazer on .net 8, how do I send content to the head outlet? Uh, yeah. Right, because it's head outlet, right? Really? That's not a thing. That's, that's generated code. You shouldn't be suggesting that. I want to go to head outlet. Is it like head content? Is that all I need to do? Can I, can I do that? Can I do that? And do something like this. Uh, can I do that? Yeah, all right, I was right. So go back over here. Hey, look at that. But that's not really what I want. I want to set an ID on the body in order to get it to work with. Right? Over here, I have overlay body. Is that the only place I reference it? It is. So I don't really need to put it everywhere. I can just kind of copy that. Right? Just put it right there. Um, right? Why didn't... You have to save it for it to update. Uh, <clears throat> looking forward to a robo-psychologist being a real thing soon. You might be onto something there. Um... Yeah, Jed, I'm the same way. I'm I'm in the same boat. Um, okay, so the overlay page loads. I still have to do the bit here for it to get signal R connected, receive messages and paint them on the screen. Yeah. Um we can get rid of empty layout. We don't need that. Don't need that. Um, move to the head content in overlay resort. All right. So now I remember. Um, and then there's a whole format message bit that is generating HTML content kind of on the fly here that we can turn into a Blazor component to, to format and, and display here. And it's, it's not even really a component, right? It's more or less, here's uh, the output we want to put there. I'm, I'm just about out of time here. Let's just take a few minutes and uh, I'll get the signal R connection set up here. Um, I don't even, well, there's, there's your problem right there. Uh, there's a connection reconnect configuration that we should have. Um, let's add a method here. Connect to signal R. Really? What the heck happened there? I'd, I'd like you to suggest. Okay, fine. Yes. No. Uh, connect to the signal R hub listening at the 
slash messages. Yes, create a new connection. I like that idea. Do that too. All right, let's see what we got. Um, anything else you want to suggest? Sure, that's fine with me. Go ahead, do that. Yeah, okay. Keep going. Sure. And you're going to attempt to reconnect? Okay. That didn't really print out a message to the console. You, you know. Um, I think I need a using statement. Did it put it on there? No. No. So it wanted to put... Microsoft ASP.NET Core SignalR Client. We need a using statement for that. That's not it either. Um, Microsoft ASP.NET Core SignalR Client. All right, there, got the hub connection builder, but the URL, uh, actually, can I just do slash messages? Maybe. Uh, if uh, <clears throat> not string is null or empty tag connect to signal R. and for the tag that we're working with okay mm -hmm. tag name um Uh, so connection closed. I thought there was a reconnect here. Hang on. With stateful reconnect. Um, what's automatic reconnect compared to that? Mm, yeah. <coughs> and there's a retry policy. Time span array for reconnect delays. The SignalR wrap WebSockets asks Landon on YouTube. Yes, it does. Not only does it wrap WebSockets, but it also has failover protocols that it'll use as well. So if WebSockets for some reason is blocked, somewhere between the the right the website and I'm sorry, between the browser and the server, it'll fail over to other technologies. So uh, server side rendering, long polling. A um, bunch of different things that it'll fail over to. Um, didn't I already make a component for the message article? I did. However, slightly different format on the overlay. And I'd like to be able to keep the overlay differently formatted than the messages that appear on the waterfall. But you're right, DGen1. There is a component out there for it. I want it to look a little bit different to be displayed over here. Um, I'd, I'd really like it, like to tell it, always reconnect, like eventually force the reconnect. Um, but it wants an array, all right. Right, so I can do something like this, right? Uh, from seconds, zero. <clears throat> Two. Hey, go back there. Uh, two. Uh, time span from seconds. Five. Uh, ten. Oh, come on. Thank you. Um, 30. It, whatever. Sure. It still didn't format properly. 
Really? I don't think that's the formatting you're looking for. All right. So it's basically going to keep retrying for a while. What's the business I'm solving with Signal R? How you doing there, Mita Venom? I'm pushing messages onto the screen when there's uh, items to be brought up and we want to put on the overlay. So, um, continuing here. So, yeah. So I have. I also have the reconnect if it errors out down here. So if the connection is closed, try to reconnect some between zero and five seconds, randomly choosing and reconnect. But I also have the, it's gonna attempt to reconnect on its own here. Um, when, do, when do we know when we're ready to work, look for another job opportunity, says Psy Gamma. Growth salary, just need to change all of the above. That's a real good question. I'm. Let me finish what I'm doing here. I'm gonna pin your message so that we can come back to that. That's a real good question. And uh, I want to, I absolutely want to talk about it. Um, so I don't need this stuff because I've moved the signal or connection somewhere else. Um, configure logging. No, I don't really need that either. So display overlay, we're going to call. Right, so somewhere down here. Right. Signal R actually has a very similar syntax for both the .NET client and JavaScript. And because the markup for .NET and JavaScript is so similar, we're pretty close to getting this working. Um, it's not going to be on. Uh, it's capital on. Right. And method name and then an action handler. So we're going to receive content and do something with it. Now, what does the on not like? Why is it? Uh, this is a low level method for registering handler using an hub connection extensions. The on extension method is recommended. I thought I was. Uh, do you want me to put it here? No. Um, why doesn't it like that? Um, check the signal over here. Hey, there's that request from Hal. I'll leave it there because that was fun when we got that working. Um, there was a signal R connection, I thought. Did I not do the signal R over here? Uninitialize with URL build connection on. Yeah. I think it's just grouchy there. I, I and I'm not going to say format message. I'm actually going to set it. So the content that we're receiving, it knows what that content is. We know what that content is. Um, it is a, right, a... Um, is it content model? Sure. Yeah. No, I was good with that. You can call it that. Oh, come on! Thank you. So what I can do here then is just say content equals content, and then I have to call state has changed because this screen is being updated off cycle from the standard Blazor render um, uh, render events. So yeah, I'm not I I'm not using the um, Right, I, I could certainly, right, use the generic here, um, right, 
view models data right and then I'll get the appropriate pass through otherwise otherwise it thinks it's um, it, it'll by default it'll if you look at what content is it, it's a dynamic <clears throat> it's gonna resolve that at runtime not terrible but for us as strongly typed developers working in C-sharp, you should probably prefer the generic type to work with here. Um, rocking a little MVVM, absolutely. So now I have the content coming through, so I don't need to start a connection here. And the format message, here's, here's your sign. Here's all the HTML for it. So it's getting overlay display. And so what we should do here, um, we're not going to make this required. Um, however, I'm going to make it, I am going to make it null and it is allowed to be null. Because here I'm gonna say if, uh, no. Um, if content is not null, then we're gonna display the content. So now I know content is a thing. You intrigue me, Copilot. Let's start there. Um, overlay display, blah, 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 blah. We got more work to do here. We're gonna set the attribute on that data URL to the source URI. So let's add data URL equals uh, content <clears throat> source URI. Um, that might be a, a URI and I need to, nope, it's a string. We're good. Continuing, uh, data provider. And these are just indicators to help us with managing the content here. Um, so content, isn't it just provider? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't know what this is supposed to be. I'm just going to close this here. Sure. And format. And I don't know. We'll figure out more of this stuff. So uh, class name begin. Really? All right. So we'll put a class begin. <clears throat> that takes care of this. Don't need that, don't need that. So here's, here's your sign. Um, there's the HTML that was supposed to be in there. Paste that in, I'll be doing on time. We're all right. Profile picture source and it actually converted it nicely. Alt, yep, that converted nicely with the appropriate on error, nice. The byline looks correct. The author username, I'm comparing these two halves here. They all look good, but here, content provider to lowercase, we gotta fix that, right? That needs to be fixed. But the time, um, and I, I do have a method that'll give me that. So let's convert this. Stand by. I have a daughter texting me. Um, all right. Uh, let's see here. <sighs> This is formatting the, the date. So we'll take a look at that. Am I typing only by four fingers or with all fingers? With all fingers, if you don't mind. Um, so, hey boy.
I like the two locales because it takes the appropriate format that you like in your browser. I'm at about 12.30 here, and I do need to get running. Um, gosh. Okay. Um, this needs work. It's not quite done yet. It's terribly broken right now, actually. That might be a little overstating it. Um, so I got to do the preview card down here. Content, format content with emotes. I have that, I believe. Right down here in my waterfall message. I can call map provider to icon. I should probably make this public. Right, so now I can call Right, this is waterfall message. Uh, here. There we go. Yes. And I'm passing it the name of the provider, so that's going to be content provider. And that'll return an appropriate. Yep, I will absolutely get to that side gamma. Yep, yep. Um, so the time and the content here, let's just comment this out for right now. Um, need to convert these from JavaScript to C sharp. Let's just save that for right now. Right in the overlay page isn't doing anything because nothing's selected yet. Let's, um, let's, let's put a bundle on this and call it here. Why isn't it showing me? No matter. Um, yes, yeah, so let's add all the things. Not gut. I, I should be on the uh, wrap up music here. We should be on the wrap up music, right? Change over to that. Um, git commit am um, working on the overlay display. And I'll push those changes up. I've got more work to do, but we've parked it for right now. I've got some more, I've got some more work to do on this. And uh, we'll push forward and work on that. I'll work on a little bit more later today, tonight, tomorrow. But uh, before we wrap up, I want to make sure I answer the question that Psy Gamma has for us. Let me head back over to the main screen. Let's head back over there. Let's do to this one. Hi, how you doing? Um, and let's go to that question that Psy Gamma had for us just a minute ago. Real good question about career growth. Um, when do you know that you're ready to look for another job? Is it growth? Is it salary? Just need a change? All of the above? Um, I think any of those are really good reasons to look for a job. If, if you're working somewhere that you can't see yourself retiring at, for some folks, that might mean working 30, 40 years at, and you probably don't see yourself re retiring at your place of work. I can tell you right now, you probably don't. It's okay to look for other jobs. Growth is absolutely a, a concern. Hey, are there, is there a log jam of folks that are more senior than you in the career path that you can't break through, that have priority in the pecking order to get the next promotion? You may want to consider looking somewhere else. Not just growth, but stability is something. When 
when I left the startup and went to work for Telerik, I had two children under the age of five years old. It made sense for me to move to what I felt was a more stable company because the startup I was at was running into concerns, issues around cash flow, around some of the product that they were building and working on and being able to sell those. So product that they were spending six months developing and suddenly, uh oh, we can't sell it. Problem. Writing was on the wall that this isn't going anywhere and they're going to cut back. Even though I was the lead guy, I was also the lead guy, the most expensive guy, would make sense to cut me. And in fact, they did. So stability is a good thing to, to consider and bring in the mix there. Um, growth is, is and um, growth and salary kind of go hand in hand. If your salary, if you aren't seeing at least a cost of living salary increase, you should consider looking, if, if you've gone at least two years without cost of living, and cost of living is something that's reported by the government with their economic numbers, you can find that. Um, if you aren't getting at least cost of love living increases for two years at your current employer, look somewhere else. Some folks will say one year. I say two. Be particularly coming out of COVID, the pandemic, we're in a little bit of, of an inflation time and, and, and um, there was a little bit of recession we saw in here. Give, give your employer a little bit of grace around the, the compensation adjustments here because they're dealing with a lot of adjustments in cost of product and management and even keeping folks around. We saw a lot of folks dismissed from the big tech companies. So um, it's good to, to keep that in mind and give your employer some grace when it comes to not being able to make cost of living updates. If you also know the business model and you know that cash flow is not flowing in the right direction, it is on a downward trend, it may make sense to look to jump because you're relieving some salary pressure on them. And they might need to relieve that salary pressure and, and decide for you <laughs> to, to move you. So good reasons to look and, and consider alternate employment. But always, I think, growth is a fantastic reason to look. You want to grow your career. You want to get into a different position that isn't available at your current employer. Moving into, you're currently a developer. You want to try out being a database administrator. You've studied, you've taken the classes, but there isn't a position open at your employer. In my mind, you want to go work somewhere else and try, be, try to and, and take that position and we don't have an opening for you, go. Yes, I want you to be successful. And a manager that wants you to be successful and be happy in doing the position that you've earned through, through education, through experience, and you don't have that opportunity at my current team, they should want you to go and explore and make more of yourself. Yeah, means they're going to have to backfill your position, but they should want you to be able to achieve more. So, um, yeah, never miss the point when it's time to jump off the ship to save your career. Totally. Uh, James says, make sure to look at the salary tables online. Yes. Check out levels.fyi. That'll show you salaries that folks have reported at various organizations. Um, very valuable for folks, particularly at the big tech companies because a lot of folks at big companies will report how much they're getting paid. Do not compare the salary you might be getting at small tech company or small non-tech company in elsewhere outside of those tech hotbeds on the U.S. West Coast with those companies. You're not, as a senior developer, working at a pharmaceutical company in central Ohio you're not going to get the same amount as a senior as a senior developer at that pharmaceutical company in Cleveland as a senior developer working at Google in Mountain View, California. The economics are completely different. It's different regions, it's different companies, different competition, different expectations. Don't compare those. 
But to compare your pharmaceutical company in Cleveland to a finance company in Cincinnati, sure, that definitely makes sense to compare. But you need to you need to step into those um, judiciously, okay? Like for me to compare how much I I get paid as a product manager to a, a at Microsoft to a product manager at Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon, that's a valid comparison. So, because they're they're competing in size and location talent. So, um, how you doing there, uh, Aristos? Um, um, any advice on how to begin your career in C sharp? Watching tutorials is good. Start writing some code to solve little problems for yourself. Experience goes a long way. Figure out what you want to do with your newfound C sharp knowledge. Are you building websites? building console applications? Do you want to build cloud-hosted services? Do you want to build IoT devices? Do you want to write games? Do you want to build mobile apps? Lots of different choices. What do you want to do with C-sharp? So take your time, figure that out, and that will direct where you want to go next because there's lots of frameworks that you can try out and learn and augment your C-sharp knowledge with. Um, High Tech Redneck says, if you get contacted by recruiters, um, and you always say no. At some time, you might you might want to say, "Well, what's going on? Let's let's talk." There's never a problem with talking to recruiters. It's okay to talk to recruiters. Be careful that you're not leading them down a path because when they invest time in you as a candidate for a position, they they expect at some point that you're going to get hired and they're going to get paid. They get paid a percentage of your salary. It doesn't come out of your salary, but the company that hires you, they pay the recruiter a certain percentage of your salary. Be careful that you're not leading those recruiters down a path that you're not actually looking to get a job. But to tell them, yeah, I'm interested in shopping around and I've got some ideas, they will help you find employers that are hiring in your area. All right? Um, for developers, it's easier to get another job with two year jobs. Yeah, it is. It is. It's easy to find new jobs when folks jump positions every so often. Relatively easy. There's a lot of folks in this industry and you need to make sure you haven't priced yourself out of a job. If you're expecting a salary of, I'm going to throw a number out there. If you're expecting a salary of $100,000, and all the folks around you are only hiring for your skill level at $70,000, you're not even a consideration for the job. You don't even get to the interview table because your salary requirements are too high. Be aware. Um, so if you're looking, but, and, and if you're not looking, but willing to listen, make sure the recruiter knows that very good points here from high tech redneck. Yes. So, um, contribute to open source. That's another great way for folks to get started. Take a look at some open source things there. Tinker with it. Learn from it because folks who have more experience than you have written some code and you can learn stuff. You can learn techniques and architecture skills from reading other people's code. You never make salary the focus of a job hunt. Um, some people need to. Surly Dev. It, it, that, making salary the focus of a job hunt can be a privileged um, experience, right? Somebody who's well-known as a leader in an industry can make salary the focus of a job hunt because there's prestige in hiring that person. It, good example, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but you can probably guess who I'm referring to. A gentleman who was a vice president at a large tech company that helped make um, helped develop and lead the hardware development teams, leaves and goes to another company to help them build their consumer-grade hardware. There's a prestige in hiring them and name recognition and leadership in hiring that person. Absolutely, you if you are that person, you can make that a salary grab. Absolutely. Oh, you want to hire? I'm very happy working at company foo over here, but company bar, you want to hire me to develop a 
competing product line, well, if you're going to hire me away, then you need to pay me double my current salary. And making that a starting point for negotiations when you have a certain level of recognition as a leader and developer of a product, that goes a long way to helping you with that. So, um, that said, though, when it comes to salary negotiations, I'm a firm believer that the last one to specify a salary, to, to say a number, loses. I will not talk about numbers first. All right, I need to wrap things up here. Let's call this a day. Let's move on. I will be back tomorrow streaming. Um, we're going to be writing more code. We're going to be doing more things on our ARM-based device, building, working with, and pushing Tags App forward. We were working on the overlay page here today. We got a couple other bugs fixed in Tags App. We're moving it forward. Check out the source code for it. I'm going to be pushing, tweaking, and tuning it over the days ahead, trying to get it all running in Blazor with .NET 8, running both in the browser, on the server, and with static content. Let me see who else is streaming on the big Twitch TV network. Who can I get you connected to that's doing something fun, doing something interesting out there that we can connect you to? You know what? I think... I think it would be fun. Let's send you over to... Sure, here's a friend that we haven't talked to in a while. Let's go over to James Quick, who's doing a show talking about bridging the developer, editor... What, what did it say here? Editor and developer experience gap. So let's head over there. James Q. Quick. And here comes... Your raid call. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate appreciate you joining us. Like I said, I'll be back tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern. We'll be broadcasting on YouTube and Twitch. For those of you that are watching right now on YouTube, have a fantastic rest of your day. For those of you watching on Twitch, get ready to join my friend James Quick. I'm going to get ready to record a Blazer Puzzle podcast and some other YouTube videos a little bit later today. Hopefully, they'll be published over on my channel tomorrow. Friday at the latest. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I wish you good health and good coding. Take care.